Hello and welcome to another day of HVG. This is day three. Uh, what you saw there was some entries from our student competition. So make sure to go check them out. Um, and we're going to start today with a talk from one of our sponsors, Unity. Hi, my name is Tim Cooper and I work in the professional artistry organization at Unity. Today, I want to talk to you about some of the work we're doing at Unity to enhance content creation. At Unity, we believe the world is better with more creators in it, and we want to unlock their creativity by providing state-of-the-art tooling. As a creator, now is a great time to be making amazing and immersive experiences by utilizing the tool set of graphics features that Unity provides. We have an extensive set of tooling that can be used for various kinds of content creation. This starts with tools like Speedtree, that allow for the creation of beautiful plants and foliage for placement in real-time and non-real-time scenes, to the Ziva Suite, the best in-class character and creature deformation and simulation tool, which enables artists to create sophisticated movement for both offline CG and real-time in a scalable way, built upon biomechanically-based machine-learned simulations. And collaboration tools like Sync Sketch that allow for remote teams to collaborate, iterate quickly, and provide feedback to one another. Pushing into the higher end, we also have tools from Weta, such as Manuka, a flagship spectral path tracing renderer using the, that is used to generate final shots, which is able to produce physically accurate results based upon the specific spectral lighting profiles of each element and at each stage in the VFX pipeline, from the active, actual individual filters and lenses to the specifics of each camera sensor. Loki, a physics-based simulator for visual effects, including water, fire, smoke, hair, cloth, muscles, and plants, which utilizes highly accurate numerical solvers. Lumberjack, the core tool set for vegetation and includes modeling, editing, and deformation tools. Using Lumberjack, artists can author and edit plant topology, including animated geometry, managed level of detail, instancing, and variability among individual assets. Totora, a procedural growth and simulation system for vegetation and biomes, that integrates with Lumberjack to create large scale and complex scenes procedurally. Using Totora, artists can grow individual trees and, and entire forest biomes, grow other vegetation such as vines, adjust growth parameters and control biomechanics, add snow cover and reduce the complexity and sizes of their scenes. Barbershop, a suite of tools for hair and fur that supports the entire workflow from growth through grooming. Artists can use a combination of procedural and artist guided tools to grow hair and fur adjust growth patterns and groom the final model. 
At Unity, we have a long history of building graphics technology that reaches a wide range of hardware while still pushing for the fidelity desired by our customers. From features that enable the rendering of side-scrolling games like Ori and the Will of the Wisps, a breathtakingly beautiful game, through to technology that can scale from mobile to real-time ray tracing that, that is used in games like Lego Builder's Journey. Our goal with Unity Graphics technology is to give our creators maximum freedom for their creative vision. You can make something 2D, 3D, cell shaded realistic, or cartoon. It's a long list. It's important to us to ensure that developers have the tools to be flexible with the types of content they wish to create. What productions have we been building internally at Unity with all of this technology? Our latest creation is the Enemies demo. Running at 4K 30 FPS on a modern PC, it uses Unity's high definition rendering pipeline and includes real-time ray tracing and many more technologies. The real-time production showcases a standout digital human character rendered with novel technology for subsurface scattering, which includes sophisticated blood flow simulation, advanced strand-based hair simulation and rendering, as well as global illumination through the adaptive pro volume approach and much, much more. And I'm sure many of you here are already familiar with our previous demos, like The Heretic and Wind Up, a stylized experience. You can find many more at Unity's website, such as Book of the Dead, Reality versus Illusion, Boat Attack, and so much more. Of course, to enable the development of great products and novel techniques, Unity invests a significant research and innovation in the areas of real-time rendering, offline rendering, machine learning, simulation, deformation, and animation across many of our locations, which now includes New Zealand's Weta Digital. For example, here are some key publications that were put out in 2022 from conferences across Unity. You can also check out a ton of Unity material at SIGRA, from the technical papers to courses on advanced real-time rendering, building the open metaverse, the interactive experiences in real-time live, and the enemy cinematic in the electronic theater and much, much more. Thank you. I will now pass over to the hot 3D panel. So welcome to the hot 3D session. Um, we have four uh, very interesting presentations. We're glad to have hot 3D back at HPG 2022. Um, so we will um, introduce each speaker and have their presentation. We can take a couple of questions for each, and if, if we have time at the end, we'll have a roundtable discussion. Um, so, uh, by the way, I'm Steve Molnar from NVIDIA. Our first um, presenter will be Naveen Matem from Intel, and he's going to be um, talking to us about Alchemist, which is Intel's new GPU. Uh, everyone in the computer graphics field is excited to see Intel's new discrete GPU architecture and, and their offerings. Uh, designing a new GPU that's not incremental from the past gives an opportunity for new innovations that move the industry forward. So um, Naveen um, joined Intel in 2000. He's worked on the design and microarchitecture and hardware architecture on many parts of the GPU pipeline. Uh, he had a key role in the development of Intel's GPU instruction set for multiple generations. Uh, Naveen holds a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronics from Bangalore University and master's degree from Arizona State University. So Naveen. Uh, hi, this is Naveen. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, we'll briefly start uh, right away, jump into uh, what Intel's next uh, GPU architecture is going to look like uh, and how we are trying to evolve uh, from the integrated graphic space moving on to desktop and data center spaces. Um, two key uh, aspects I would like to touch here uh, today as we speak through is one, one is uh, scaling of the GPU, the kind of like the challenges involved in going from a uh, a 10 watt to a 500 watt uh, machine. Uh, second aspect of this will be to briefly touch on um, the Alchemist GPU that's being introduced uh, this year. Uh, the first is more generic to talk about the challenges involved and what it takes to 
build a scalable architecture. The second is a little more product specific. What are our key challenges? Uh, the challenges uh, get involved in uh, scaling the architecture that has to feed multiple uh, segments. This is uh, um, uh, the, the development of uh, key capabilities, features, you know, hardware, software interfaces that are required to uh, support uh, a, a variety of uh, API, APIs that are used across these segments. Uh, mm -hmm. Some ways to kind of distinguish between what these segments are typically falls in in uh, two, key, two key metrics, right? Uh, uh, teraflops and power. So uh, if we talk about uh, an example of the XE architecture timeline, uh, we can talk about our IP scaling from uh, uh, 10 watts to 500 watts ranging from two teraflops to a 60 teraflop machines. Of course, these are um, uh, early examples and um, they, make, they, they do expect to go uh, beyond this uh, spectrum. But that's the kind of giving the magnitude and the range that one IP, and I keep repeating this, is that one IP needs to cover. Uh, not just that, it, 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 teraflops in power is just one uh, such indicator. Uh, there are others like uh, tops, you know, performance of specific use, use cases. These use cases also vary, right? Uh, integrated graphics space have a specific use case. Discretes vary a little bit. And uh, data center, of course, wants its own um, uh, set of metrics. Um, they do pivot on one key aspect that each one is, each segment is interested, uh, while uh, the rest of the uh, capabilities also need to be supported. Uh, this provides this unique challenge to scale this machine from our integrated space uh, all the way high. We started off uh, with the integrated space. So in the past, the machine was a, what we call a slice architecture. We'll get into the details uh, uh, so in the next deck, is we started off with a slice architecture. This is a piece of the uh, architecture that is one block. And all that was always needed for an integrated space. But as we uh, uh, move forward, uh, we wanted to get to this a, a scalable slice architecture, meaning it can scale to multiple slices. And that also has two key components. We'll touch, we'll touch on them. The scalable XE cores, what these are and what they contain, and other uh, efficiency and balancing of resources. And again, touching base, why do we need balancing of resources? As the machine size grows, we need to uh, extract the efficient use of the um, flops added here. Uh, second is depending on the segment we are going, the resources will vary. Uh, now, as a uh, as a process of walking through the scalable architecture, I'm picking the XEHPG. This is our uh, segment that uses the uh, used in the Alchemist GPU. Right, the scaling of the graphics engine. I'm going to use the XCHPG as a, uh, a walking set uh, to extract the information. Uh, the other segments, uh, for example, XELP, which is going into integrated graphics, or XEHPC, which grows into data center. Uh, I view these as, uh, in some form, a subset of the XEHPG and a superset of XEHPG in other forms. So, as we walk through the pieces, uh, I can I'll briefly touch base on on what aspects uh, are different in these segments. Uh, Sorry. Uh, okay, using the HPG to showcase the applications here. So the first concept is what we call the render slice. So the render slice is is also known as the slice architecture. In addition to the the the, the idea used to have multiple of these uh, render uh, slices or slices uh, attached to. Uh, two ends. One end is, is our global dispatch, which takes care of ensuring we use these render slices uh, efficiently. And the other is the memory on the other end, right? Um, this is our uh, um, unified cache structure, uh, efficiently handle the bandwidth across these uh, uh, render slices, uh, and also 
uh, handle fabric of data uh, going between these slices. That's one case. The second is our global dispatch. So when we want to go from a single slice to this multi-slice, there's aspects of work distribution at the top, there is aspects of work redistribution in the middle of the pipeline. So as we walk through the pipeline somewhere along uh, different uh, uh, shading phases, we want work to be redistributed and not have hotspots, for example. Um, in addition, it also supports these multiple contexts or queues, if you will, uh, between um, aspects of uh, render, uh, just purely compute, which is used uh, both in graphics and AI ML, and also, uh, miscellaneous uh, uh, aspects, right? Like a copy engine or a media engine for uh, transcode and encode. Uh, so the, this, these uh, uh, render slices are uh, built are from the building blocks, and we the idea is to stamp these render slices. Uh, the, to stamp these render slices uh, in order to uh, get the uh, large machine size we would like to get. So you would start with one uh, core, uh, core slice and then you would scale it forward. Uh, let's walk through what is entailed in these render slices and the different blocks. Okay, the first one, what is, uh, what's inside a render slice? Uh, 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 the XE architecture has four XE cores uh, with uh, matrix operations. Uh, these are uh, these are what we call the XMX. Uh, in addition to the vector engines, we'll touch on what the XE core entails. In addition to a, in addition to the XE core, um, in the XE architecture coming from the previous one, we've added uh, uh, ray tracing units. Um, ray tracing units. Uh, 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 and uh, a fully functional and optimized uh, fixed function required for DX12 Ultimate Gaming. So what's in this uh, uh, DX12 Ultimate Gaming fixed functions is our uh, geometry pipeline, which uh, handles your uh, DX uh, geometry phases uh, from vertex shader all the way to uh, pre-pixel uh, fa pixel shader phase. It also has our pipelines to handle uh, early depths, right? Uh, it, um, and, and also, finally, once these are uh, once after we do the rasterizer and have our polygons ready, we have to assemble these uh, for pixel shading. So, in order to support this, uh, there is a, uh, a cross render slice interface, a crossbar that goes across these render slices, either for distribution of work that needs to go from one slice to another, or load balancing, where if you have hotspotting in one, you move the data to the other. Um, we have the ray tracing for your lighting and uh, visual effects. The, the, the acceleration of BVH tra traversal intersection tests happen in these, in these blocks. And in addition, uh, in order to support these high uh, bandwidth requirements that are coming from a combination of both uh, ray tracing functions and XMX capabilities, a high bandwidth, low latency L1 uh, L1 cache has been introduced here. Uh, the combination of L1 and SLM is, is key to uh, getting high efficiency out of these uh, vector and uh, XMS uh, blocks. Uh, the render slice is used uh, in the HPG space as a way to uh, showcase the overall GPUs building blocks. Um, several of these uh, components here are architecture architected and built to um, um, scale their uh, speeds and feeds and capacity. So uh, we, ha we can actually have one segment with a slightly lower XMS throughput, a lower L1 capacity, another segment which an extremely high XMS capability and, and an even larger L1 capacity. Uh, this is how uh, a, a quote unquote one IP is now uh, built to scale uh, for uh, different segments as we need. Uh, this in addition needs to be optimized not only for performance, but also for power and area based on the uh, segment uh, requirements. Uh, so in what, what what's inside the XE core? Um, 
Now we started with the top uh, slice, then we said we have a render slice uh, with these blocks, and the final one is the XE core. So what's inside the XE core? For the XE architecture that's going into Alchemist and a couple of other products, we start off with a um, 16 vector engines uh, and uh, 16 matrix engines. So the 16 vector engines are what we call the SIMD8, uh, each uh, supporting up to um, uh, 16 operations per clock, and the XMS supports up to 256 operations per clock if you are talking about int 8. Uh, uh, of course, each, each of these uh, programmable cores uh, needs some supporting blocks. Uh, these uh, could be in the form of uh, um, a local uh, dispatcher, which manages uh, the 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 SIMD threads launched to these uh, vector engines, and also um, uh, a, a extremely low uh, high bandwidth instruction cache to feed these machines. Okay. Uh, there is a load store uh, engine uh, used to manage. Uh, 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 formatted and unformatted uh, data types. Um, and the, again, this comes with high bandwidth and low latency. This is really required uh, to support uh, ray tracing throughput and uh, XMS uh, capabilities that are being introduced into, into our new product lines. Uh, uh, the These building blocks, just the simple vector engine, a matrix engine, and a load store, uh, form the core building block of the IP, right? This is the XC core. It is used in HPG and other segments uh, fall from these. Just as, think of it as at the end of the day, um, we have a full um, render slice with several knobs at the bottom. Uh, we turn these knobs and dials to get the, uh, the right uh, capacities, speeds and feeds uh, for different segments. Uh, that's our uh, that that's our uh, uh, like a very brief short intro of our architecture. Uh, what do we intend to do over our multi-year uh, discrete GPU roadmap? Is uh, we start off with the Alchemist. Uh, the next one uh, that that is coming right behind this is called Battle Mage. The one after that is Celestial, and the one after that is Druid. The architecture team is working um, in. Uh, in order to start with these discrete GPU roadmaps to build a superset architecture, and we will derive other segments out of these. So wh where are we now, right? Uh, where and what are our future challenges? Uh, again, we, we hammer on this. We have we want to continue with this one IP solution. We have the unique opportunity here uh, to use and build uh, on this one IP. That that is a machine that uh, the balance of the machine with uh, optimum raw performance. It's just not raw performance in some cases. It it has to be a balance of raw performance, performance per watt, and performance per mm square. Um, and and where do these vary? I mean, if you see integrated graphics, where we're talking about six to thirty watt segments. Uh, these uh, are slowly moving towards new challenge uh, challenges and requirements, especially in content creation. Uh, while gaming has been the key benchmark in the segment used to develop a, uh, a GPU, uh, content creation along with uh, uh, media capabilities is, is uh, very interesting for an uh, integrated graphics space. A dif discrete graphics space, I show this as 100 watts to 500 watts, but really each of these solutions have to span uh, both a notebook space, which is sub 100 watts, and also a desktop space. Uh, new challenges coming in, these segments, path tracing, neural rendering, um, uh, several hardware and software solutions have to be innovated here. And uh, we expect these to fall through to the other segments. And finally, the data center, two forms of data center, one that is required for uh, high performance computing, AI, ML, um, which is really needing high bandwidth and a very high density of operations. And while uh, the other requires uh, streaming cases of video, uh, and uh, offline rendering. Uh, with that, um, Intel is uh, in, Intel's taking this future step of continuing to innovate and build uh, to serve these three segments uh, going forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Naveen.
Can people hear me? Go on stage. Can people hear me? I can. <laughs> okay, all right. I'll assume that people can hear me. Um, anyway, well, thank you, Naveen. I appreciate that um, this description of the, yeah, Intel's new DGPU architecture. Um, I have some questions. I imagine others do, um, but we are running a little bit late on time. So I think we will hold questions until the end to make sure that each of our presenters has an opportunity to, um, yeah, to give their, their presentation. Um, so we'll move now to uh, Takahiro Harada um, from AMD. And uh, his presentation is, uh, the title is HIPRT, a ray tracing library in HIP. Um, so GPU ray tracing is a key area of innovation. And uh, um, Takahiro is a fellow engineer at AMD. He's been leading research and development of the Radeon Pro Render um, and HIP ray tracing. Um, in previous lives, he's worked on real-time physics simulation and was an assistant professor at the University of Tokyo, where he earned his PhD in engineering. So, um, Takahiro. Am I on the stage now? So you guys here? All right, Steve, thank you for introduction. Um, yeah, let me quickly start my presentation because yeah, I don't think we have enough time for that. All right, uh, before I get into the topic, I would like to do a very short introduction of myself. Um, my name is Takahiro Harada from MD, and then I'm working in the Advanced Rendering Research Group where we do like a bunch of like a mix of research and development. So you can find our activities on our website, which is shown on the right. We are working on a bunch of like uh, technologies or SDKs. And then today I'm going to talk about uh, this one, HIPRT. And HIPRT is a ray tracing library, which is written in HIP. And I'm going to start with the design of the API first, and then go into a bit about the detail of the API in this talk. All right, uh, before explaining about HIPRT, uh, there are a few ray tracing APIs out there, as you know, like DXR and Vulkan ray tracing and metal performance shaders ray tracing from Apple and M NVIDIA Optics. And then one thing I want to ask you, actually it was very interesting if I can do that in person, was that, yeah, I want to hear what do you think about these like APIs, ray tracing APIs. Do you like them or do you think things could be improved? Of course, the preference for of an API is very subjective. So it is not easy to find the perfect API for everyone. So however, uh, we thought that a ray tracing API can be improved from these existing APIs. So this is a motivation of this hip party development. And also another background or another uh, motivation behind this development is the necessity of the API. <clears throat> so AMD released RDNA2 GPUs, which we call Navi2. Uh, this Navi2 GPU have hardware ray tracing unit called Ray Accelerator. And this hardware can be used in DXR, for example, however, uh, there's no way for people to use it from HIP program. That's another problem we need to address. So that's another motivation of behind this like HIP RT API. So uh, by the way, HIP is um, like a new computer language AMD has been developing recently, and it is very similar to CUDA C++ API. Then the question we asked ourselves was, how should we design the API? Should we just take an existing API and then modify a bit, or should we design something totally different? And as I said in the previous slide, we thought that there's a room for the APIs to be improved. Uh, more specifically, we thought it could be simplified a bit more. And then these three points are the points we wanted to satisfy from this API. So first, we wanted to make the API to be minimum, which makes uh, things easier for everybody. Of course, it is going to make things easier for the developer. And also it is going to make things easier for like our team who is maintaining the library. However, designing a minimum API may be a double-edged sword because it may look harder 
to use because it doesn't hide a lot of things under the API. However, uh, a developer is more likely to be able to get a better performance uh, easier if you use the API properly. And the second, we thought there could be, um, there should be no need to run a different shader stages, which other Azure Ray Tracing API requires. Therefore, we did not add any new shader stages or kernel types. And then, uh, because of these two designs, the API should be easier to add to an existing applications. The application does not need to uh, go through a major refactoring to add uh, this like uh, hardware ray tracing to an existing APIs, existing HIP or CUDA API, CUDA applications. And we have been working on this HIPRT library for a while, but it's very new actually. Uh, the first release was at April this year. So it's just a few months ago. And then we are defining it and we are going to release version 1.1 very soon. So uh, we are planning to do it at serious, serious time frame. Okay, uh, so far we discussed about the design choices we made for Hipparty API. And let's, let's look at the, a bit more detail about the API. Um, as I said, Hipparty is a library which does ray tracing. And then um, obviously it does use hardware ray tracing on MD GPUs. Um, if you use or if you run it on Navi 2 GPUs, which have the hardware unit. We also implemented a software code path in Hipparty so that it can run on older GPUs like Vega or Navi 1 generations. And also, if I was a developer and if I need to take a library, I do not want to get tied to a single vendor if possible. So we thought that you may feel the same. Therefore, we do not want to lock you or the developers to a, the AMD platform only. Therefore, we are trying to make it run as many as platform as possible. And then thanks to the similarity of the APIs, meaning the HIP API and CUDA APIs, uh, HIP party can run on AMD GPU and NVIDIA GPUs. It uses HIP implementation for AMD and CUDA implementation for NVIDIA GPU. And in order to realize that, we actually use uh, Orochi library. This is another library we developed, but uh, because I don't have enough time, so I'm going to just skip it. And then, yeah, the implementation of Hipparty looks like this illustration on the slide. So Hipparty is built on top of Orochi library. And then this Orochi library is executing a HIP API if the device is an AMD GPU and execute CUDA API if the device is an NVIDIA GPU. And as of today, of course, hardware ray tracing only works for AMD GPUs, but we want to, we want to add like hardware acceleration for other vendors as well, if possible. And the basic primitive of Hipparty is, of course, a triangle. As we are going to see it later, a developer need to provide the list of triangles to the API, then it is going to compile them so that it can perform like the session efficiently. And of course, yeah, sometimes we need more than triangles, right? So if your application needs or requires primitives other than triangles, it is also fine. We can support that. So the way we support it is that you can extend the behavior of this ray tracing API, HIPRT, by writing a custom intersection functions. Okay, and then I'd like to move on and then explain a bit more about the APIs. And then when a developer uses HIPRT API, he doesn't need to know much about things, but he only need to know about two things. So we keep it like, um, yeah, simpler. So the first thing is hip RT geometry. So this is a representation of a geometry of triangle mesh, like a keyboard, which is shown in the slide. And some API calls it instance. So I think, yeah, you know what I'm talking about here. And then, of course, like if we create a scene, it is not only the geometry or single geometry, right? So we need to produce, we need to introduce another concept, which is a scene object, which we call Hipparty scene. So this is uh, actually nothing but just a collection of Hipparty geometries to set up a scene. So when we construct a scene, we create a bunch of geometries like that, 
and then set the transform for each object for geometry. And then transform is something we call hip party frame, and then we construct that scene. So these two are the only things you need to understand to get started with hip party API. That's yeah, very simple. And then we have a bunch of try a uh, bunch of flags. And then yeah, when we trace array, we define it with flag. Um, it could be any hit or closest hit. And I think most of you are familiar with these concepts, so I don't go into detail. And also we implement several uh, BBH types, which you can choose depending on the needs of your application. So if you need very fast build, you can go for that. But if you need like a high quality build, but you can take time for BBH building, we have high quality build as well. And um, what is very interesting, I think, and different from other APIs is that you can even build a BBH by yourself and then pass it to HipArty API. In this way, we are not actually rotting people from a new invention. So we would like to see more research on the improvement of the BBH build. All right, so I think I covered most of the right concepts about HipRT. And then in order to use HipRT, all you need to do is right, just get the latest driver package from AMD website if you are running on the AMD GPU. And then, yeah, just download the SDK package from the project page. The package has a tutorial, but it is likely that the one we released at GPU Open GitHub in this link here is newer. So you probably want to just get the latest tutorial from there and then overwrite it. And that's all you need to do or try HIPRT. And it's very simple. And then if you get that, uh, here's a list of tutorials we have right now, starting with a very simple intersection to uh, triangles. And then we cover how to use custom intersection function and motion blur and so on. All right, and if you have a request for a sample tutorial, we would like to hear. So feel free to make a GitHub issues or send me some tutorial. And this is the last part, but yeah, let me check. All right. Yeah, I think I need to wrap up quickly. Let's see. And go back to the slide. And all right. So yeah, I wanted to go through the how to actually, I wanted to explain how to do the Geometry intersection, and we need to do four steps, which is context creation first. And I'm not going to go into the detail. And then after that, you need to do geometry creation or construction. Then you need to construct a kernel, or you need to compile a kernel, and then you have to just ex execute kernel. That's very simple. And as I said, we are not introducing any like additional shader stages, and then the device code or the kernel looks something like this. This is nothing but just a pure heap kernel code, except for this heap ray object, which is just like a structure to store the ray object. And then this is how we define the ray, and then this is how we like store the result. And then the missing piece here is the intersection. And then what, how we, what we need to do to get intersection working is just put these three lines so create an object and then get next hit, call get next hit, and it is going to return the hit. That's pretty much it. And then that's all you need to get this triangle rendered. All right. Um, yeah. Let's skip that. And then let me wrap it up. So as I said earlier, the next release of Hipparty is going to be around CGF 2022, which we are going to add bounding box program. And also, it contains a bunch of fixes and optimizations. And at first, I'd like to thank all the Hipparty development team in Advanced Rendering Research Group, EMD, and also David and Bruno for supporting the, the work on top. And yeah, if you want to know more about Hipparty, here are some pointers and resources. And this is a disclaimer, disclaimer for the talk. And then, all right, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Takahiro. Um, we are running short on time, so what I invite you to do is to add your questions to the question board, and um, and you, so offline we should get an opportunity to answer some of those, and and maybe we'll have time at the end. But we need to move on to our next presentation. Our next presenter will be Brian Budge from Meta Reality Labs. 
and his topic is DGDT, a real-time geometry system for remote cinematic style rendering. Um, Brian is a member of the graphics research team at Meta Reality Labs, where he manages a group of rendering researchers. In previous lives, he was a founding member of the Autodesk Cloud Rendering Service, and then worked at Google on their Borg scheduling service and the Clips AI curating video device. Uh, Brian received his PhD from UC Davis. So Brian, take it away. Great. Um, well, I've already been introduced, so I'll move on to the next slide. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we'd want a geometry system, a new geometry system. Uh, I'll give a brief system overview. I'll talk a bit about some compression that we use and at the render compute, and then I'll try to uh, fit in a little bit of the results that we have so far uh, if there's time. Okay, so uh, we want to have a system that will enable rendering of deformable geometry in real time. Uh, especially if that geometry is coming from remote. Um, that geometry could be highly complex film quality assets. We want to supply the geometry in a usable way for ray tracing and photorealistic rendering, for example, uh, via path tracing. So I'll talk a little bit about some existing related systems. Uh, USD seems to be like a format uh, of the day for, for film. It can hold all kinds of geometry uh, as well as lights, cameras, materials, textures, etc. It's really flexible. Uh, many different film rendering pipelines have customized uh, pipelines that include USD. Uh, but USD doesn't really have facilities that would enable uh, remote real-time or interactive geometric updates. Alembic is a format that is also used heavily in film. Uh, it has affordances for meshes, curves, subdivision surfaces, etc. And there is some compression that comes along with Alembic. Uh, that makes archives smaller than full raw data. Um, Alembic holds data in one or more large archives for baked animations. Uh, unfortunately, it, in real-time update situations, Alembic would not be sufficient because you don't really derive much benefit from single-frame archives. Uh, GLTF is built specifically for efficient transmission and loading of 3D scenes. It's extensible. Uh, there's multiple mesh compression extend, including Draco, which seems to be kind of a best in class uh, mesh compression algorithm. And um, I've seen at least one user has made an extension for curves. Uh, so we could have also built on GLTF extensibility, but we chose to design our own data schema on flat buffers because it was easier to match the concepts of cinematic renderers and ray tracing APIs. Uh, we could make the format self-documenting um, and then it's also got facilities for version compatibility and uh, flat buffers are super fast and speed is of the essence. There's also, as have been talked about a little bit already in this session, uh, a lot of standard ray tracing APIs now. Uh, Vulkan, Metal, DX all have ray tracing APIs. Optics, Embry, and uh, also recently AMD now have uh, also their proprietary ray tracing APIs. And uh, these share a lot of commonalities in how scenes are set up and updated. And this kind of thing is a big boon for photorealistic rendering systems. Uh, they don't have to necessarily write their own uh, ray tracing pieces. Uh, we're kind of unaware of any existing geometry systems that can marshal the geometry data and manage these ray tracing APIs in a way that's reusable across renderers. OK, so. <clears throat> The GDT is broken into three parts. There's a flat, flat buffer schema, which defines the data layout for scene geometry. We also have the session writer that controls what is serialized according to the schema format, and the geometry subsystem, which consumes the serialized scene data and prepares it for the renderer. The session writer tracks changes from frame to frame and ensures that only data that is changing will be serialized. It also controls encoding to compressed formats available in the schema. The session writer system is a cascading series of composed types. From the bottom layer, each type can serialize itself if changes were made or report up the chain that it was unmodified. Whenever an object in the system is looking to see if it was modified, it checks its members for changes. If none were changed, then the current object is also unmodified and that is reported up the chain. The geometry subsystem integrates into the renderer. 
Objects and primitives get initially created by an implementation of the geometry engine adapter. And from then on, they know how to update themselves when given new schema data. This is also where compute graphs are evaluated. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. OK, uh, this is an eye chart, and there's a lot going on here. But the big takeaway is that DGDT offers a base layer that is then customizable according to the devices you want to render on. So far, we implemented a CUDA layer, where GPU compute and memory copies are implemented, and an optics layer, which offers acceleration structure building and hooks for setting up shader binding tables. Any renderer wishing to interface with DGDT makes its own geometry engine adapter that inherits from DGDT's adapters. And so we've also implemented a demo renderer that builds on this and also provides renderer-specific logic around how, the trace, how to trace rays and shade. In the future, we will support more device types and ray tracing libraries like Embry. OK, uh, so I don't have a lot of time to go into detail, but I measured a bunch of bandwidths that could affect a remote rendering system. Uh, suffice to say that there are many orders of magnitude difference between various parts of the system, and it makes sense to try to make geometry updates as compact as possible to reduce bandwidth required throughout the whole system. Okay, DGDT stands for delta of geometry over delta in time. Uh, the main underlying premise of the, of the approach is to only send changes to scene state, uh, which already reduces a significant uh, reduction in data. Um, but then we can also lossy compress changing data. Um, in our simple com simplest compression schemes, we quantize from 32-bit float to 16-bit uh, fixed point within bounding boxes of the deltas of the vertices, uh, giving a 2x compression for those uh, while retaining better precision than we would have if we used, for example, 16-bit floating point. We also octencode unit vectors, giving a 3 to 4x compression for those. In this example, we can see that by eliminating redundant data and employing our simple compression, we can already see a large reduction in size, something like a 5x compression. But we can do better than that. Here, I'm showing basically geometry at frame n, frame n plus 1, and in red lines, the deltas between those that we would be compressing with fi uh, fixed 16 directly. But we can do better. Uh, we can actually compute a best fit transform between the previous frame and the current frame, and that has a tendency to reduce the size of the deltas uh, fairly substantially. And uh, this kind of thing can lead to, to better compression. So um, the residual, for those who aren't familiar, is the difference between neighboring elements. Um, and in this case, it's the difference between neighboring vertices and a vertex buffer. Uh, but we find that uh, we still want to use deltas here, and we get a far peakier distribution when we do residuals of the deltas instead of the residuals of the vertices themselves. Uh, this makes it very good for um, entropy encoding like Huffman code. Rodin works very well on most content, especially meshes with smooth animation that can be well predicted from frame to frame. In this dancing clip, for example, uh, because we're at 60 FPS, the dancer's motion is very smooth and doesn't change drastically from frame to frame, um, and we're able to accurately, accurately predict the motion. And as a result, Rodin outperforms Draco and Corto by a large margin. On other sequences, uh, at lower frame rates where the mesh is very fine, uh, Rodin does not perform as well relatively as Corto and Draco, because those techniques get really good spatial prediction from the nearby vertices. And in this case, we're using about 17% more bits than Corto uh, at quality level um, 80 dB. While Rodin performs well on most deformable content with a competitive compression ratio, its main advantage is speed. Uh, because of its simplicity in both encoding and decoding, Rodin outperforms Draco and Corto by a large margin. We also have implemented decoding on the GPU, so we can benefit from reduced uh, content size all the way to the GPU. Finally, all we need is a deforming vertex buffer. So we aren't limited to triangle meshes. We can decode arbitrary polygon meshes, subdivision surfaces, and curves using this technique. Finally, we preserve connectivity, which means that we can uh, refit BVHs instead of uh, rebuilding for most deformations. OK, so um, we'd actually prefer to avoid transferring data at all when we can. Of course, that's not typically feasible for the entirety of a scene. 
uh, an animated scene at least, uh, but we can be clever and avoid sending some heavy data. For example, we could compute shading normals at the renderer rather than sending the shading normals across. Um, we can send subdivision surfaces and subdivide at the renderer. We can send skeletons and skin at the renderer. Um, so how do we accomplish this? Uh, I have an example on the left, which involves calculating skinning before attaching curves to a surface. And on the right, you can see the dependency graph. Uh, motion samples have coordinate and index buffers on the GPU, shown in the green bubbles. And procedurals don't have any GPU buffers. The only purpose of procedurals is to build and evaluate computation graphs. Procedurals read and write buffers of sample, motion samples, shown in black arrows. To run tasks in parallel and avoid race conditions, we introduce dependencies between procedurals and buffers with dispenso futures. Those are shown in gray dashed arrows. Um, in the future, we also need to still implement dependencies between procedurals. That's, that's on our list. OK, so here's an example of one of these types of operations. Uh, we want to avoid expensive curve updates. So we can pre-process the curves and uh, the corresponding mesh and find uh, the closest triangle for each curve. And then we can find the barycentric coordinate of the closest point. Using that information, we then bring those curves into the static mesh's lo local space. And then at runtime, we apply another change of basis to bring the curve back into world space. Here we see the original curves in static pose on the top left and the static mesh on the bottom left. We compute the local space curves shown in the middle along with triangle indices and barycentric coordinates. At runtime, we get an attached to surface procedural that applies the static curves to animated mesh to get the animated curves. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about some of our initial results. Um, this is a scanned mesh, uh, scanned data essentially from a colleague of mine, Ronald. Um, it consists of 329,000 polygons, 222,000 curves, uh, consisting of 13.7 million curve control points. Um, and a, a huge percentage of the scene payload is the hair control points. So if we use the attached to surface functionality, we already see a very large improvement. And then if we add fixed 16 encoding and opt encoding, uh, we get even better. Then if we further omit serialized normals and do smooth normal uh, computation at the renderer, we can achieve about a 222x reduction in payload size. Uh, we also see dramatic improvements to the encoding and rendering times, and we achieve an overall frame rate of 28 frames per second uh, just with the simple rendering versus uncompressed data uh, rendering at about five frames per second. Here's another scene that we've used for our, uh, our case studies. Um, this is a much smaller scene and simpler scene, but we've done a little bit more testing with it. Uh, it's got 142,000 polygons, um, and there's no curves in this scene. Um, it's just nicely animated motion capture data. And, but this scene shows the, the benefits of the Rodin compression. Um, we achieve a total of 24X reduction in payload size between the elimination of redundant data, uh, use of the Rodin compression of the vertices and using the renderer uh, to compute smooth normals. Um, and I'll also say that one of the biggest benefits here uh, by applying these is that we are actually doing an analysis of the meshes to make sure that the topolo topologies don't change, which allows us to do fast BVH refit instead of full rebuild. And that's particularly important. If you look at the, the pie chart on the left, even with refit, it's still a dominating factor in the costs of, of doing um, updates and render. Uh, pretty much everything else like added together is roughly equivalent to just the BVH refit cost. Um, on the right hand side, I'm showing a bandwidth trade-off curve. So uh, we can see that actually by doing no compression and or uh, not allowing redundant data, those two curves are the ones on the bottom. They're never the fastest. And part of the reason for that is that we're not analyzing those meshes to see if we can do refit. So we're, we're always doing a rebuild. Um, up until about a one gigabit connection, uh, using Rodin plus smooth normals 
is the fastest. We get about 50 frames per second at a 100 megabit connection and 200 frames per second at a one gigabit connection. From about one gigabit to 10 gigabit, um, smooth normals at the renderer, but using a, a, the simpler FIX16 encoding of vertices winds up being fastest, giving us about 330 frames per second at a 10 gigabit connection. And in the highest bandwidth range, which is essentially in system, uh, the fastest option is to keep FIX16 encoding, OCT encoding, uh, both on, and eventually we reach nearly 400 frames per second. Okay, I just want to thank uh, my colleagues who've been assisting with this project, and uh, hopefully I will be able to answer some questions for you in the panel. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, we'll hold questions here, or you can put your questions in the question board, and I invite the speakers to, to um, look at the question board and, and uh, look for questions to you. Um, our final um, speaker in this hot 3D session is Sarita Adve from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And um, her, she will be um, speaking on Elixir, enabling end-to-end -end extended reality systems research. And um, Dr. Adve is a professor of computer science um, at, UNC, at UIUC, and her research interests span hardware, programming language, runtimes, and applications. And um, She's most recently been working on extended reality that combines AR, VR, and mixed reality. And um, she's a member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences, an ACM and IEEE fellow, and has served as ACM SIG Arts Chair. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And um, Dr. Adve. Uh, so the title of my talk is Elixir, Enabling End-to-End -end Extended Reality Systems Research. Uh, this is work with many collaborators that I will acknowledge on slides. So extended reality, including virtual augmented and mixed reality, is, the, uh, is likely to be the next major computing interface and has the potential to transform virtually every human activity, including science, medicine, education, and so on. But there's an orders of magnitude gap in the power, performance, and quality of experience between um, current systems and the systems we desire. So for example, for complete immersion, we would like about 200 uh, megapixels of resolution, but current state-of-the-art XR systems uh, provide seven. Uh, for every day, um, uh, if we want to wear AR glasses all the time, um, uh, everywhere, uh, we are looking at a power budget of about a few hundred, a couple hundred milliwatts uh, to ensure that our skin doesn't burn. Uh, but the current systems, the state-of-the-art systems provide, um, have about seven watts in terms of weight uh, to have a comfortable form factor for AR glasses. Uh, we would like about tens of grams of weight, but today's systems, uh, the state of the art is about 500 grams. And there are many such gaps between the current and desired. So uh, with the end of Moore's law, this type of gap, uh, bridging this type of gap would be challenging no matter the domain. But for extended reality, there are many other challenges as well. Um, uh, first of all, to do systems research in this area requires diverse expertise. Of course, graphics is front and center, but there's vision, audio, video, optics, haptics. And for a computer systems person like myself, these are all uh, uh, new fields. Um, uh, these systems have complex metrics. Um, they have multiple user-driven end-to-end quality of experience metrics, motion to photon latency, image quality, audio quality, and so on. So evaluating the goodness of the systems we design is hard. Uh, to bridge this kind of gap, it's very unlikely that we can do it just by innovations in a single layer of the system. So I know yesterday we heard uh, comments like, oh, hardware is going to keep getting better. But, you know, we are at the end of that road here. It's not going to keep getting better unless we work together with, with others in the, in the system and application stack. So we need cross-layer uh, system co-design between the hardware, the compiler, the OS, and the algorithm. And it's also pretty clear, I think, that 
um, um, meeting the com computational demands of these systems just at the end user device is probably not going to happen in the power on envelopes we have. And so we're going to have to bring in the edge and the cloud and, and co-design all of these systems to meet uh, the demands. So when we started working in this area a few uh, years ago, um, the biggest problem though for us was not all of this. This was all a problem too, but the biggest problem was that the systems that um, uh, that were out there were closed and proprietary, and there were very few participants in the systems community. There were no open reference systems or benchmarks to get this work going. And so there was a large barrier to entry for open R&D for XR systems. And so we pivoted and we said, OK, um, you know, how can we democratize XR systems research development and benchmarking? And so that's how uh, the Elixir um, uh, project uh, started. Uh, Elixir stands for Illinois Extended Reality Testbed. Today, Elixir is an open source full system XR testbed. Uh, it has state of the art XR components. Uh, with a modular runtime, it is compatible with the emerging OpenXR standard, which is the standard a standard interface between applications and the XR runtime. And we've extensively characterized um, uh, aspects of of XR systems, and it's being used for a wide variety of research. So before I go ahead and tell you more about Elixir, I want to show you a few demos to get across the fact that this is a real working system. So this first demo here is. Um, it's just how we use Elixir day to day for our research. Uh, you see um, uh, at the bottom here, you see a grayscale window where my student is walking around uh, with the camera in the physical space that he's traversing. This is our lab. And then um, on the in the middle here, you see on the left, you see uh, the virtual space that he's traversing and the headset position that um, that Elixir is is uh, is uh, calculating. And so this is a third party view that helps us debug and know where, where the headset is supposed to be. On the right side, you see a window that is the actual eye buffers that Elixir is producing. And uh, way to the bottom left, you see a debug window that tells us what's going on in the system. So this is how we use the system day to day. Uh, but then uh, for a lot of the experiments, we do want to wear a headset and, and actually do the QOE quality of experience uh, with a headset uh, experiments. And so we have Joseph here uh, with a North Star headset, which we use only as a display. Elixir actually runs on this uh, very novel mobile system that Jeffrey is rolling around in the back uh, on a PC. Uh, that's just sending pixels to be displayed on the North Star. And on the right, uh, you can see uh, uh, Joseph um, uh, traversing, uh, uh, you know, we're running Sponza and Joseph uh, traversing this castle. And uh, and you can see the tracking works uh, pretty well, rendering works pretty well, and, and uh, you know, Joseph is enjoying the experience. Okay. Uh, so now what if Joseph doesn't want Jeffrey to be rolling around uh, the chair? Well, you know, Joseph can um, uh, uh, run Elixir on this backpack PC and walk around. And again, he's he's enjoying Sponza. And keep in mind, this is a completely open source, right? So completely open source system. Uh, you can change uh, whatever you want in this XR system. You can measure whatever you want and uh, and and see what the experience is. And um, uh, so, so today, it's uh, or in this demo, you're seeing Joseph run this on a pretty beefy PC uh, with a beefy GPU, but uh, and using a lot of power. But you know that's not where we want to be. And so recently, we've also incorporated um, uh, a functionality to offload uh, various components um, from from Elixir. So um, here we have. Uh, the backpack PC on the right again, uh, right bottom, uh, representing the end user device. And then the monitor at the top is um, is the monitor that's displaying what's running on the backpack PC. On the left, you have a server to which we are offloading uh, tracking in this case. So we're offloading tracking to the server from the backpack PC through the network. And uh, the center window here is the... Uh, the uh, the third party view that you've seen before, and again you can see that uh, the way we offload tracking is able to you know, be able to deal with the network latency and uh, and go tracking and rendering and so on. Okay, so this is uh, what uh, you know Elixir can do. This is uh, it's you know already pretty feature rich. Um, uh, again, an open source end to end uh, XR uh, testbed. 
Um, but there's a lot more to be done, right? And uh, and we don't think we can do this by ourselves. So we would like uh, you all uh, and the broader community to participate. So we launched the Elixir Consortium with several industry and academic partners, including ARM, Meta, uh, Micron, Nordstar, NVIDIA, et cetera. And the goals of this consortium are to create a reference open source test bed, uh, again, an end to end open source test bed with state of the art components and interfaces. And, um, and also the second goal is to create a reference benchmarking methodology. Uh, you know, what are the standard applications and data sets we want to use? What are the system configurations we want to use? What metrics? And third, to build the XR systems research and development community, which is pretty fragmented. So today, this work is supported um, uh, by um, an NSF size community research infrastructure program, in addition to other support as well. But uh, this particular program is uh, it's nice to have the NSF blessing to make this a community wide uh, research infrastructure. Um, so next, let me give you a deep dive of what Elixir really is. Uh, before that, I want to thank the large team of students and developers and the many consultations that we've had with colleagues in industry and academia and our founding uh, consortium members and sponsors. And in particular, uh, I want to highlight Josefa. Uh, he is my lead graduate student who's been co-leading this project with me from the beginning. He's graduating this year and would be quite the catch for, for any um, company or um, uh, department. Um, okay, so what's uh, Elixir? So Elixir has, uh, just like any XR system, there are three components of perception pipeline, visual pipeline, and the audio pipeline. Uh, the perception pipeline tells us, uh, as you know, uh, you know, where in the world the user is and what the world around the user looks like. The visual pipeline takes information from the perception pipeline and generates the pixels to be displayed. And the audio pipeline, again, takes information from the perception pipeline and generates the audio. So all of these, all of the components in these three pipelines communicate with each other through the Elixir communication interface and runtime. And then on top of this, we run uh, uh, XR applications. We can run applications written directly to Elixir or through the open XR interface uh, for which we use the Monado imp implementation. And then um, uh, now we can also offload uh, 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 components, as, as I said. Uh, today, all of these components here run in software, but we have a lot of research going on where uh, we are um, accelerating these in hardware. And you know, a big part of the research is to figure out what to accelerate, how to accelerate, et cetera. But today, it's all in software running on, um, on either a PC or a mobile device uh, embedded system, such as Jetson, et cetera. And as I said, we can also offload. OK, so um, just a little bit more deep, uh, deep, going a little bit deeper to show what we can support. Uh, for the perception pipeline, we support several cameras and, and IMUs to provide um, uh, poses. Uh, we have uh, support for visual inertial odometry, VIO, that provides the position and head orientation or pose of the user. Uh, so VIO does a good job in terms of accuracy, but it is uh, pretty slow. And so we have the IMU integrator, which takes uh, accurate but slow poses from the VIO and fast but uh, noisy poses from the IMU, and then uh, you know, combines them all together to produce high frequency pose estimates uh, that are accurate. Uh, we have po uh, pose prediction so that we can extrapolate the uh, poses to a future timestamp that the visual pipeline will need. Uh, we do scene reconstruction uh, using RGB depth cameras to build a dense 3D map of the world. Uh, we have support for eye tracking. Uh, this is still uh, with offline data sets. We don't quite have an eye tracking camera yet, but this is work in progress. Um, for the visual pipeline, uh, we provide uh, asynchronous reprojection so that when the application or the renderer provides us with a frame to render, uh, we can warp it uh, based on the latest pose estimate and, and the pose prediction to account for the head movement that happened from the time that renderer began to the time that we will display uh, the image. And so this cuts down motion to photon latency. Uh, we also have support for uh, correction for lens distortion and chromatic aberration to correct for distortion due to curved lenses. Uh, we have support for computational hol holography. We don't have holographic displays, but uh, we can do the computation to deal with multiple focal planes. Um, and uh, again, you know, this, uh, if, if we use this component in the system configuration, we can uh, account for this computation, although uh, the pixels don't get displayed because we don't have such a display. 
Okay, so uh, the audio pipeline involves audio encoding. We can encode multiple sound sources into higher order ambisonics uh, sound field. Uh, playback, uh, we rotate and zoom um, this, uh, this HOA sound field for the user's latest pose and perform binauralization uh, so, so we can produce audio. And um, so I've described to you all of the individual components that the system has. But XR is not just a collection of components, right? It is a full system. And so we actually have the full system. So the data flow looks like this. We have you know, IMUs, uh, I IMU data at a high frequency. The camera runs at a lower frequency. And the camera and the uh, IMU feed to the VIO. Uh, the VIO and the IMU feed into the IMU integrator. There's eye tracking. Reconstruction gets information from the camera. The application that's doing the rendering gets information from the eye tracker, the IMU integrator, reconstruction. Uh, reprojection gets information from the application IMU and, and, and so on. Uh, so there's a lot going on in the system, different components running at different frequencies. There are multiple interacting pipelines. Uh, there are soft and hard dependencies and multiple quality of experience metrics. Our runtime uh, puts this all together uh, using a modular and flexible architecture. So we uh, paid a lot of attention to ensuring that the architecture is modular um, so that researchers can, can plug and play. They can uh, swap in and out the algorithms they want to use. And it's a very flexible system. So, so the Elixir components themselves are plugins. They're separately compiled, dynamically loaded. As I said, you can easily swap them, uh, swap uh, new components, new implementations of components. And all of this, uh, there's flexibility, but we also wanted efficiency. So um, we have a standard published subscribe mechanism, but this uses a copy-free shared memory implementation, which is pretty efficient. Uh, and again, supporting uh, asynchronous or asynchronous consumers in involving hard and soft dependencies. So uh, again, we have an end-to-end -end system that balances flexibility with efficiency. For applications, as I said, we can write directly, applications directly to Elixir, or we can support OpenXR applications. Today, we use the Monado implementation. Uh, uh, the standard results that I will show uh, use the Godot game engine running on top of, uh, of Elixir. And soon, we will have Unity and Unreal support as well. We are just following their Linux OpenXR um, uh, support. Uh, for quality metrics, we do motion to photon latency. We have image quality metrics and extensive telemetry, such as frame rates, missed frames, uh, time distributions, et cetera. Um, so this is a full list of Elixir components today. It's changing as we speak. We keep adding new components. Uh, we can configure Elixir using you know, a subset of these components and using offline data sets, live experiments. And it's a, it's a pretty rich test bed. So what, what have we found so far, right? So I'll give you a really very quick whirlwind tour of, of the uh, things that Elixir can do. Uh, so the results I'm gonna show very quickly again uh, for a specific uh, configuration uh, running on a high-end desktop machine as well as embedded class NVIDIA Jetson um, uh, systems uh, using applications with varying graphics intensities such as Fonza, materials, platform, et cetera, running on the Godot game engine. Uh, so here's a very quick sort of run through, uh, you know, we produce frame rates, we've measured execution times and their distributions, we've measured power, you know, which components are using a power, which part of the system is, is using more power, what is the quality of experience and, and, and all of that. Right. So these are the first published performance power QE results for an end to end XR system and I refer you to our paper to, to see uh, more details. So what do these results tell us? Okay, so there's been a lot of implications that we've gleaned from these results. In fact, it set almost, I think, a 10-year research agenda for my group and, and others. Uh, so we found, you know, we uh, showed a substantial performance power QE gap uh, where we it's clear we need to specialize the entire hardware software and system. We showed that no XR component do dominates all metrics. So we really need to study everything together, rendering and pose estimation. All of this needs to be studied together. And, and power consumption goes beyond just the traditional CPU, GPU, DDR. There's significant variability in the system. So scheduling is important. And poor component metrics do not capture QoE. So at the end of this, really, you know, Elixir provides a rich playground for systems research. And it's really a new style of research where 
Uh, we wanted to co-design across different system layers and the application. Uh, we want to do this for multiple user devices because this is a this is you know that's where multi-user XR is where the action is in the context of a distributed system. All of this co-designed with a QoE-driven um, a goodness metrics. So end-to-end QoE-driven full system co-design. This is a really hard problem, but we are making a lot of um, uh, uh, headway. We have lots of research going on with Elixir. Lots of institutions involved. Uh, Graphics community, please participate. I want to thank Anjul and Dave Lukki from NVIDIA who are working with us and it's been great, but there's a lot more to be done. So I hope you will join us in this effort and, uh, and participate in this vision and in our consortium. There are a bunch of questions on the question board and uh, we'll get our panelists here. Um, the next session starts at 125. So we have a, a few minutes we can um, we can go here before we've got to queue up for that next session. Um, if you need to take a break, then take a break. Um, we have several questions on the question board and I don't see answers there. So we can go through those and I have some of my own here. So uh, can you all see the question board? Um, why don't we start with the first? Start with the first one for Takahiro. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I can start with that. So the question is like, how well does Hippolyte interrupt with the X and work on application? The answer is that like Hippolyte is just on like an implementation on top of HIP. So the HIP support like the X or work on interrupt, it, we can support. And the current situation is that HIP, HIP team is working on DX interop at the moment. So DX interop is not working today, but it is going to be added in the future. And for the working uh, work interop, this is working today. So yeah, you should be able to use it with work on application. Excellent, thanks. Yay. Okay, um, something happened to the formatting of mine here, but um, uh, can, let's see. Can you see the next question? This was by Anjul for, yeah. I believe, yeah, go ahead. So yeah, we'll... so, so Anjul's asking from the perspective of feasibility of hardware design, does glasses-based ARC more or less attractive than pass-through? So this is an interesting question and we are actually trying to uh, answer this question. We, are, uh, we don't have pass-through right now in our system, but we are uh, looking, uh, actually there's a student working on this as we speak. And uh, so, you know, hopefully soon we will give you quantitative data that that uh, that uh, uh, answers this question. Let me ask you another question while you're right there. Um, so the your system provides a lot of flexibility, and you you're measuring. You know you've got the latency, frame rate metrics, but do you have a sense for how much you are sacrificing in terms of of performance compared to just a you know dedicated um, speed of light implementation without the flexibility? Uh, we don't think our flexibility is compromising much because when we look at the amount of time we're spending in the in the actual orchestration of the runtime, because we can you know we can measure that, right? It's very very low, right? And so um, uh, so so there's uh, I I don't think that's that's an issue. We we spent a lot of time making sure that things were efficient. In fact, on the other side, right? Because we have this full end to end system. We are parts of our research, uh, you know, that would be a whole another talk to explain all of the research projects. Part of our research agenda is to do cross-component co-design. And so now, instead of just looking at scene reconstruction in isolation, we're looking at it in the context of the entire system. And we have been able to co-design parts of the system and get, you know, in certain cases, like 60x improvement in power, just because we are looking at the entire system in, in, in its entirety. Right. And so um, I hope researchers will be um, and I don't know what's happening in companies, but I know a little bit, but not everything. Right. But that's also proprietary. And so now uh, researchers have the ability to take the system and do this kind of co-design. You don't you no longer need to live in your own silos. Right. You can actually see the entire end to end system and um, and do some exciting things. OK, very good. Naveen, are you there? Um, we see your, your your icon, but we don't see you. There's a question for you. Okay, um, go ahead. Yeah, do you do you see me? Yep, yep. Yeah. So the question is, 
Uh, from Anjul, uh, can you talk about neural acceleration on XEHPG? Uh, so right now, um, on the hardware aspect of it, uh, we believe we've provided uh, necessary infrastructure hook in order to uh, provide the bandwidth and the compute capabilities, whether it's <clears throat> whether it's uh, uh, our, our matrix engines or the vector engines and, and the caching hierarchy is required. Uh, software work is in, in progress as we speak. Uh, in the file, when I said uh, future challenges, uh, I was referring to the fact that we do support this. Uh, it can be enabled, but a lot of challenges and studies is required um, uh, using the current software models to understand where our bottlenecks are what are the next acceleration points required in order to achieve uh, real-time use cases? Uh, because this is where you start off with, you know, your uh, super scaling, uh, sorry, upscaling anti-aliasing kind of one, like XCSS. You add denoise, and as you add more, you need to understand uh, what are our um, pivot points. In so the capability exists when software is fully enabled and up and running. Um, we, we, we are almost there, and uh, we can actually see how to improve uh, going forward. OK, very good. A question for Takahiro from Simon Fenny. Yep. So the question is, if the user supplies the BBH to the HIP party, are they expected to do their own volume testing? And the answer is no. So the reason is that like, what we are doing in the API is that like we just take the VBH from the user and we just translate it into the format of our hardware uh, intersection. So yeah, it's just a translation and the box is box and then it is going to just execute the lay box intersection in the API in the library. So you don't have to write your own volume testing. And if you want to write one, I want to I want to hear why you want to do that. Um, yeah, would be good to hear you, that kind of feedback. All right, thank you. Very good. Um, let's see, one question for all of you. Um, if you, I hope you'd be willing to um, to upload your slides if they're not already. We'd love to have your, your presentations to be able to um, link to them from the from the HPG website. So um, so anyway, we encourage you to do that, hope you can. Um, I have a, a question for Naveen here. Um, so it's ambitious to cover this whole space of low, you know, low power iGPUs all the way to high end DGPUs for all of these, um, you know, all of these product segments. Do you find? I, I don't. I didn't hear you talk about any unbridgeable differences. Are there any places that just make you just do fundamentally different things that that you could talk about or or yeah share? Um, we do come across uh, areas there where. Um... It, it is quite challenging to ensure uh, you have uh, one IP. Uh, it uh, slowly falls into the category of uh, losing efficiency on one segment, a kind of a compromise uh, to give up one and, and do the best in the other. Uh, but that that is, um, uh, in some cases, tough solutions are available. In some cases, there are not. And uh, I think as we learn more and want to uh, uh, kind of stay on this track, uh, we will figure out uh, if we really need to diverge. And so far, um, I, without get, getting into too much details, we, I do have some challenges. We do see some challenges, especially uh, when you want to go from an IP that is in the client space to the data center, um, keeping parts of the IP um, that cater to some of the structural and uh, um, uh, physical design aspects uh, make it extremely challenging. Uh, we are attempting not to diverge, but on a case by case, uh, who knows? We may we may choose to replace some blocks, but the goal is we want to continue to uh, go in this direction. Because uh, in terms of key KPIs, right? Uh, if one's good for one segment, it's very likely good for another segment. Right? We always say uh, power efficiency is great for integrated graphics. So why do I care about discrete? But hey, it is useful there as well. So um, 
yes, the, the short answer is there are some uh, key areas where we are still trying to figure out, but um, I think we have solutions to bridge the gap. Uh, it's just a matter of which, uh, um, when we might intercept that. Okay, thank you. We got to uh, prepare for the next session. Final um, applause for our presenters. Thanks all of you for, um, for your contributions and everybody being here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, we're switching to our next session right away. <laughs> we're pretty much skipping the break today. Our next session is going to be an invited talk uh, as a part of our diversity and inclusion program. But this is going to be a little bit of a different talk. So one of the things we were thinking is that we would like people to have access to some really sound advice, especially early on in their careers uh, for, for grad students or for early computer scientists. Uh, and as soon as this idea came up, I immediately, immediately thought about Aaron Lepon because uh, he had given a um, an interview at the Utah's Compute Magazine and given some some really sound advice to uh, to graduate students there. And I thought he would be the perfect person to to uh, really do that for us. So this is not just going to be, I think, about um, for for uh, early career people. Because uh, for uh, th those of us who are uh, in a position to give advice to others, it would be good for us to really think about what are the kinds of things that we did right to get here, uh, to get to where we are, and what are the kinds of things that we could have done better if you could communicate to ourselves in the past. Uh, and I think um, Aaron will, will do a, a great job, and I'm really looking forward to this. Talk. So let me give you a little bit of an intro. So Aaron, uh, Aaron Lepon is uh, Vice President Graphics Research at NVIDIA and leads at NVIDIA's real-time rendering research team. Aaron has led uh, real-time rendering and graphics programming model research teams for over 14 years and has um, productized many research ideas into games, film rendering, GPU hardware, and GPU APIs. His team's inventions have played uh, key roles in bringing ray tracing to real-time graphics, contributing uh, AI uh, and computer graphics, and pioneering real-time AI and computer graphics. Uh, NVIDIA's products uh, derived from uh, Aaron's team's inventions it includes DLSS, uh, RTX Direct Elimination, uh, RTX DI, uh, NVIDIA is real-time denoiser, um, NRD, uh, the Optics Deep Learning Denoiser, and, and more. Also, I should mention that uh, Patrick Clarberg's uh, real-time path tracing keynote on Monday uh, of this week, uh, on, that we had on Monday this week, uh, was one of some of the recent uh, research in, in Aaron's team. So let's, let's bring Aaron. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate the uh, introduction and opportunity to give the talk. Um, I'll take you your head nod, Jem, that you can uh, see me and uh, this is working. I will, uh, so um, over the last 14 years or so of leading real-time computer graphics research, I've had the opportunity to observe researchers at a wide range of stages of their career, from early stage, just starting out after graduate school, to researchers far more senior than myself with far more achievements and accolades than I ever hoped to achieve. What I'll share with those of you today who are, this talk is especially targeted at those of you who are in graduate school or in early stages of your career as a scientist, um, are observations I've made of behaviors and characteristics of some of the most successful researchers. Um, by the way, for the admins, I'm hearing the uh, sound murmur 
in the background here that's quite distracting. If there's a way you could kill that, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. It's fixed. Okay. Um, so I wish I'd known these things as a graduate student in the early stages of my career, but I don't have access to Doc Brown and I don't have access to his DeLorean, but I will share with you today for those of you that can benefit um, where I couldn't. So starting out for those of you still taking classes, for those of you still in graduate school, um, high performance graphics is a, is, a, is a field, is a sport where we have this whole stack this really, really broad range of skill sets and areas that our field impacts. We start from everywhere from the highest level of theory and algorithm work all the way down to custom design hardware specifically for our field. Very few other fields of computer science have that broad range. And it covers everything from hardware design, operating system slash driver design. We have programming languages specifically designed for our field, by our field. Um, as well as the graphics algorithms that we love. Obviously, parallel programming is also at the heart of this. But um, I, I see that the most impactful researchers in our field have this broad knowledge and didn't specialize too early. And I'm really grateful for the University of Utah, where at the time I was there as a graduate student, we were required to take these broad range of classes before specializing in, in computer graphics. And I, I, I end up relying on this, this breadth on a regular basis in, in my own career and job, and I see this among top researchers. As a capstone to coursework, um, again, I wanna, I wanna credit University of Utah, specifically Wilson Shea uh, was the, the compiler's professor at Utah when I was there. He's now been at Google for many, many years. Um, but Wilson gave us this just absolutely beast of a compiler's course where we built from the ground up a, a, sub, a language, which was a subset of Java. And what I found is that it, it required bringing together knowledge of computer architecture, ISA design, operating systems, programming language implementation and theory, software engineering, teamwork, and more. And I see this throughout research that the researchers who have built compilers before, even if they're not themselves building compilers, stand out and are able to impact a wider range of our field of high performance graphics. And again, specifically to our field, um, it so happens that I think every single job I have had, starting from my first internship at Pixar almost 20 years ago, um, has involved every, all of these have been computer graphics jobs, all of these have been high performance graphics. And all of them, I have been, either been building a compiler or overseeing groups building or changing compilers. It's compilers are an integral part of our field. But even if you don't intend to or expect to ever be building a compiler, take the hardest compiler class you can find. It brings all this together and gives you the ability to innovate across our entire stack. Internships are a key part of the graduate experience. And I see many graduate students um, understand this and pursue it, and, and some skip this, and I, or some maybe do it differently than, um, than I think you could. And, and I want to give you this perspective as a, as a leader of a research team that internships are an extended job interview for both you, the student, and the employer, for you to find out what's this company actually like to work at, and um, what's this group like to work with, and for the employer to find out what's this student with this great resume I actually like to work with. Um, so I strongly encourage you to intern at multiple companies throughout your graduate degree and to give it your absolute all. Um, don't multitask your life while you're doing your internship. It should absolutely consume you and you should give it your best and your all because it really is an extended job interview. Um, but it, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity to increase your, um, the people you're collaborating with and broaden your research beyond your uh, graduate research group. And certainly when interns, uh, when more senior graduate students come and intern with us, people have a few papers already, we give them autonomy almost um, the same as a, a full-time research scientist. Um, it's really expected that people come in and, and act as full-time research scientists. And so to take that opportunity while you're a student, it's something unique to the experience. Funding. Graduate student, I certainly didn't think that much about funding as, as a graduate student. Um, but it's, you know, there are very few people in the world who have the opportunity to gaze at the sky and think, what problem should I go solve today, this month, this year? Um, most people are under a lot more 
direction than that to deliver something that's going to generate obvious value in the near future. But as graduate students and industry researchers, we have this incredible freedom. Why is that? I think it's important to, to ask that. I have seen industry groups and labs um, do uh, be, be flourish and grow and then overnight almost disappear. Um, it's important to understand who's paying you and why. So if you, if you are a graduate student, read the grant proposals that your professor wrote that are funding you and understand what your professor is accountable for in your research. And if you're an industry researcher starting out, understand why the CEO of your company and the management above you is funding your research group. What are their hopes and dreams of what's going to come out of funding that you as a researcher to stare at the sky and dream? Um, let those funding goals influence your, your big picture, your answer to the question of if the project is wildly successful, what will change? What will the impact be? But don't let that funding dictate exactly which problem you're going to solve in which order or the details of your journey. That kind of fine grain management is development, not research. The funding goals are there to specify the, the what if I'm wildly successful dreams. So about those dreams, again, there's very few people in the world who have the opportunity to be in a research position. Those of us who have or are in these research positions, it is our job to take the biggest risks and seek out high risk, high reward objectives. Um, those who are in product groups are also tasked with doing unknowns all the time, with pursuing solving problems that haven't been solved before, but they can't take as much risk. I'll use a mountain analogy. On the left, we have a mountain, which is pretty sure you're gonna be able to climb it, even if it's never been climbed before, this one has given the trail. But um, it's our job as researchers to be more like the mountaineers on the right, dream big, take high risk, high reward research, but also learning to manage the risk along that journey and be profitable along that journey where profit might mean that doesn't mean making money. It means you learn something. You will learn what not to do. That's important as well. Um, and you, it's also important to be able to say, I'm not ready for that challenge right now. I'm going to go off in this direction. Risk management is a big part of doing research, but dream big, ignore the projects that lead to easy publications. Sometimes I receive resumes of applicants that have long lists of publications and they're small publications, they're low impact publications, and it doesn't get my attention. That person may not even get an interview. Someone might give me a resume with just a few small number of papers that completely change the field. That's going to get a lot more attention. Um, it's about the impact of your work, not the number of publications. Go after the high risk endeavors. Collaboration is something that people talk about. It, the word is used a lot. Oh, let's collaborate. The halls of HPG or in-person HPG, in-person SIGGRAPH, run into someone and, hey, have you thought about collaborating? Yes, collaborate. Oh, so and so are collaborating. I, I, use the, I hear the word used a lot and what I deem incorrectly. And so I'm going to today provide you a very specific definition of the term and encourage you to um, use this to separate what is collaboration, what is not in your own life. And that is that collaboration involves actively contributing to shared code or paper repository. Anything else is talking. Now, talking is useful. Talking is how ideas get generated in talking, lunch conversations, hallway conversations, on the phone, um, personal connections are built. Talking is an important part of being a research scientist, but it's not collaboration. And another thing that I often see people call collaboration that isn't are people who are working on similar problems in their own code base, in their own sandboxes, and they're talking about it, but they're not sharing code repository. That doesn't lead to something bigger. That, that leads to end people solving end problems at, and, and small sizes. True collaboration where you're sharing a code base can lead to much bigger impact. I see this throughout the time I've been at NVIDIA. Um, in the creation of some of the most impactful technologies that have come out of graphics research. Um, Dave Lutke and Alex Keller, my organizations, are where people join in true collaboration, and that's when things start to scale up. Related to collaboration are your academic competitors. Um, in, the, in the world of research and publishing, it's important to be first and to have the idea first and to tell people about it. But 
watch who your academic competitors are and consider instead of continuing forever to be competitors with them, consider actually collaborating with them. Because if you are publishing so closely together that you're competing with each other, that person or that group shares a passion for the same research that you do, and they might make great collaborators. Um, there were a group of us back in graduate school um, who were in the early days of general purpose programming and GPUs or GPGPU. And it might have seemed we were competitors because we were, we were first discovering that you could do these weird, crazy things with GPUs. But we, in many ways, we were working together um, and we were giving courses together. We um, became, became friends and, and collaborators. Uh, I'll, I'll give a, a, a near term um, recent anecdote about this. Um, the, there was a paper at HPG last year um, uh, led by a, a, a person named Yao Bin, who's a developer technology engineer at NVIDIA. And uh, it was in collaboration with my team. And the way that came about is that um, Chris Wyman discovered on the internal channels that Yao Bin, who was a dev tech engineer in China, had seen our restore work, had extended it to work with diffuse indirect illumination and implemented it in a branch of Unreal Engine um, and was making some great progress with it. We have this rule in NVIDIA that nobody gets to own something. Although the Restore work started with Chris and Benedict and others in my team, I'm not the manager of Restore. I don't get to own all innovation in, in Restore. Of course, I have many collaborators across the uh, in academia and, and industry in this. But um, when we saw that, instead of viewing Yalbin as a competitor, we said, well, wait a minute, this is fantastic. We want to work with you. I invited him into a staff meeting. Um, Matt Farr, Chris Wyman, and others said, Yalbin, let's let's write an HPG paper. We'll help you. And that um, was a paper that was was shown here last year at the conference. So view your, your academic competitors as potential collaborators. The uh, next are mentors. Um, I had someone early in my career, and I'm still a graduate student, advise me to to seek out multiple mentors in my life. In fact, I think I, this was during my undergraduate at, at Whitman College, um, but it wasn't specified exactly what to look for in those mentors. And um, the uh, what I've seen is that the, the people who who um, who are most successful in their careers have very thoughtfully sought out a collection of mentors that evolves over time as you, as your career progresses. Um, seek out mentors. Of course, the, the obvious piece of this is that they have something to teach you, but Evaluate your candidate mentors to ensure that these are people who will put your career advancement needs before their own and not be someone that's going to take credit for your work that will elevate you. Um, and, and that goes along with being someone that you can trust, but also turn that around and be a mentor. Again, I see some of the most successful researchers, both um, uh, having a, a constellation of mentors for different aspects of their career as well as being mentors. And um, those mentees grow into future collaborators. And um, it's an important part, important part of our field. And lastly, I've mentioned credit a couple of times. This is something that I, I spend a lot of time as a, uh, as a research manager coaching, um, and that is to give credit rather than take credit. Credit's important as a research scientist. It's important to have your name on papers, on patents, on talks. Um, but the it, but what I see happen time and time again, and really try to prevent, certainly in my organization, is that not giving credit can permanently end collaborative relationships. It can be really, really disastrous. Um, and uh, for those of you who have your name has been left off of papers that you feel like they should have been on, you know how this feels. And my advice to you is that giving credit costs you almost nothing. Not giving credit can cost you everything. Um, and be sure to credit both ideas and effort. And this isn't just, um, <laughs> this, this is not just about um, who wrote the code, and it's not just about names on papers. Um, it's also about um, when you're giving talks informally, even when you're talking within your group or your company, um, Throughout, if, if you, you know, remember where an idea came from and just drop that name and credit it, um, it, it, it builds community. It becomes a lifeblood of collaboration to be someone who's giving credit rather than taking it. People are, want to work, are attracted to work with you if they know that they're going to get credit and not have credit taken from them. Credit both ideas and effort.
And with that, I thank you. For those of you in the early stages of your career, uh, I wish you the best and I look forward to, uh, to seeing your work and the impact on our field. Yeah, happy to take some questions. Thank you, Aaron, for this inspiring talk and the good advice. Um, in the interest of time, I think we should move on to the next session. If any of you have any questions, please ask Aaron in any of the social rooms later on. Thank you. So without further ado, I'll welcome you to the technical paper session for tonight, which is on geometry and textures. We have three very exciting talks coming up. And the first one will be by Cem Yaksel. And it's the paper that goes with it is called High Performance Polynomial Root Finding for Graphics, which is a very generic problem that many of you will have encountered already. So, um, Jim, please take the stage. Hello. Hey, all right. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Jim Uxell again, and the uh, talk that I'm going to give you is about my, my paper on high performance polynomial root finding for graphics. Yes, that sounds like um, a name constructed for HBG, and that is true. But if I told you high performance polynomial root finding, you would probably tell me, oh, yeah, we need it for graphics, right? Because we really deal with polynomials everywhere in graphics. And, but the thing is, we try to avoid, we try to avoid sort of more complicated, more higher order polynomials. We try to stick with simpler polynomials because, well, they're cheaper. Now, I'm going to tell you how you can solve all sorts of polynomials much higher order than we typically do, and we can actually have pretty good performance with them. So that, that's going to be the whole topic of this talk. All right, let's start with quadratics. We love quadratics because, you know, we know the solution for it from grade school, right? The quadratic formula, you plug it in, you get your result. So we love them, but don't use that directly. Just use the slight variant I mentioned in the paper that is numerically a little bit better. So, but quadratics are super cheap, super easy. You just compute a square root and a division or two. So nothing, to be honest, will compete with the performance of quadratics. Quadratics are special, they're super fast, right? But we're, unfortunately, not all problems we have end up being quadratics. Sometimes we need to, deal with high order polynomials like cubics. And uh, cubics appear actually a lot in computer graphics. I think one of the most common use cases for cubics in high performance applications is uh, continuous collision detection. So when you have a triangle and a vertex, you need to solve a cubic to find out when they are coplanar. So this is uh, used in, in games and uh, all sorts of physics-based simulations a lot. So they, they appear a lot. How about higher order polynomials? degree four, degree five. Well, there aren't that many examples of those because those are considerably more expensive to solve. Actually, I know one paper that attempts to solve, actually solves degree five polynomial. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's that they're using an existing polynomial solver out of the box and that's uh, about an order of magnitude slower than the one that I'm going to present today. So it can be quite a bit expensive. How about going further? Degree six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten. Are you crazy? Yeah, like this is like crazy town. Like who would in their right mind think that in a high performance application, I can just go and solve an order 10 <laughs> degree 10 polynomial. That would be crazy. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you as an example. We're going to look at a, a tube like this and compute ray intersections with that tube. And that's going to come to a degree four polynomial. Sorry, degree 10 polynomial. And the details are in the paper, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's, let's get rid of that. Here's the thing. I'm going to tell you how to solve these and, and more, actually. But I'm going to do that without telling you anything that you don't already know. So it's going to be really simple stuff. You're just going to combine some existing ideas together in the right order, and we will have a high-performance polynomial root finder. Uh, so that's... Pretty much the reason why I actually attempted to write this paper, I wanted to write this paper because I thought, hey, I wanted to, I, I wish I knew about this before. That, I, that would have saved me a lot of time and energy. So hopefully by the end of this talk, 
you will be happy to use any point when you, when you run into a polynomial, you'll say, oh yeah, I know how to solve it. And that's going to be super easy. All right. So that's, that's the idea. But let's start with, let's start with cubics. All right. Cubic polynomials. Now, I avoided cubic polynomials like the plague for a long time, but I could not avoid them forever. Actually, there was <laughs> here when I was dealing with my curves, uh, my curve formulation, some of, some of these actually required solving a cubic polynomial. I could not avoid it, but it was a special specialized problem. Uh, I knew that there was always a solution and there was always one solution. So what I did in that case is that within the range, I used bisection. Don't do that. Very bad idea. Bisection is terrible, right? Don't, <laughs> if there's only, if I can say only one good thing about bisection, that would be that it works. And I'm not sure if it is good, because if it didn't work, we would probably move to the next solution, which would be so much better. So don't, don't use bisection. And the reason why I'm saying that is that, you know, like bisection, I, here's my interval that I'm interested in. And I know that there's a root with bisection. I'll just split it down the middle and see that, oh, my root is contained in this part of the region so I can get rid of the other part. So with all that computation, I received exactly equivalence of one bit worth of information. That's it. So for the next bit, I need to do this again. This is really inefficient. We can do much better. How you ask we can do much better? Well, we could use Newton iterations. Actually, that's what I would suggest that we use. And Newton iterations are not that more difficult to compute either. Like just instead of just computing the polynomial, you also compute its derivative. And when you're dealing with cubics, this derivative is a quadratic, very easy to compute. So that gives you your next guess and you iterate until you converge, right? The problem with Newton iterations is that they are notoriously unstable. Um, to make them stable and to make sure that they always work, here's a trick. You combine Newton iterations with bisection. And when you do that, you have a stable solution that always works. Hopefully, you mostly use Newton iterations and use bisection only Newton iteration when only Newton iterations fail. I actually describe exactly how to do that in detail in the paper, but I'm, I'm not getting going to get into that. It's actually fairly fairly easy to do, and the the, the solution that I describe also satisfies a, a given error bound. So this is numerical iteration, right? So you're going to have an error bound, uh, and I talk about how to make sure that your error bound is is satisfied as well. All right. But unfortunately, this is not what I did the first time. I had to actually solve cubics properly, not with bisection. I realized that, oh, wait, there's an analytical solution. How about we just implement the analytical solution? That, that works, actually. It works just fine. But you need to solve a cubic root and some trigonometric functions. That is expensive. All right. And it's not just that it's a, they're expensive. These operations are expensive. It's also. They are sort of, especially as cubic root, I, I presume they are implemented as numerical solvers. So instead of doing numerical iterations on this cubic root here, I could just do numerical iterations on my actual polynomial. And with that, I actually would get much better accuracy. So the accuracy of this analytical solution, unfortunately, is not that great. So not recommended at all. It's slow and not very accurate. Blin, Jim Blin has an, much better solution, I would say. It actually comes down to something similar. It's using similar sort of formulations. So same type of computation. It's actually a little bit more because it's using uh, homogeneous coordinates. So it becomes a little, more, little bit more involved computation-wise. But, but the accuracy is much better. So it definitely improves the accuracy. Performance, not so much. So we want high performance, right? So it'd be much better just to do numerical iterations ourselves in our own problem. But the problem there is that this gives me only one root. These would give me all of the roots. I want all of the roots. For a lot of problems that I have, I, I need all of the roots. So how do I do that? Very, very easy. So give me a cubic. Here's what I'm going to do. Super simple trick. Are you ready? I'm going to take this cubic, and I'm going to split it into three pieces, exactly, exactly at these critical points where its derivative is 0. Its derivative is a quadratic. I can very easily solve that quadratic, right? super cheap. And I can find these critical points super easily. And then I have three pieces of my polynomial. And let's say this is my interval that I'm interested in. I can easily split my polynomial into three pieces. And if I have roots in these three pieces, I can find them using numerical root finding, combining Newton and bisection. Right? That's as simple as that. 
right? And it works. It's great. And, and there's a really important benefit here. If any of these pieces do not contain a root, like the, the blue one in this case, I can easily see that before doing any numerical root finding. Because the, you see that the both endpoints are below zero. That means I cannot have any root in here, right? So I don't even have to do any numerical root finding here. In fact, I can do one step better. If I find one of these roots, let's say that I find this, this red one over here and call it XR. If I find one of these roots, then I can use deflation. So deflation would take a cubic polynomial like this. And with a known root that I've already computed, I can write this cubic as a product of x minus xr and a quadratic, right? And the coefficients of this quadratic is that they're very easy to compute using the known coefficients of the cubic and my, my known root. And with that, I'm left with a quadratic to solve now. So if I can find one of the roots, the other two roots, if I have any, I can find them very easily, very cheaply by solving a quadratic. So that is the solution that I would recommend for cubics. That is, you split the cubic into three pieces by solving a quadratic that is going to be its derivative, and then find the one root, one of the roots, using Newton iterations plus bisection, so it's guaranteed to converge to the root. And then you deflate the polynomial using the one root that you found. And finally, find the other two roots using the deflated polynomial, deflated quadratic. That's it, and it works brilliantly, it works just fine. So, Cubics are no problem. How about, how about higher order polynomials? Can we do that for polynomials of degree four plus? Well, give me a polynomial of degree four. What I'm going to do in this case is actually very similar. I'm going to take this and split it into four pieces. And I can do that by finding its critical points. Those critical points will be the zero crossings of its derivative. Its derivative is a cubic. We just talked about how to solve cubic. So if I can solve a cubic, I can solve a quadratic in the same way. And if there are any roots in any one of these pieces, I can very easily find them using the same numerical root finding, right? And hopefully one of them is in the, in the interval that I'm interested in, and I can find that root easily. If I have a degree five polynomial, I can do the same, split it into five pieces in this case by solving a, a quartic degree four polynomial. So for higher order polynomials, this is the algorithm, right? Give me a polynomial, I will first solve the zero crossings of its derivative. That's going to be a polynomial of one lower degree. And with that, I, I'm going to have a bunch of intervals. And for each one of these intervals, I'm going to look at the endpoints of the intervals, the value of the polynomial at the endpoints of the interval. If the, the sign of these endpoints are the same, then I cannot have a root. If they're different, then I definitely do have a root. And I can find that root using numerical root finding with combination of bisection and, and, and Newton iterations. One important note here. Now, if you look at this algorithm in terms of its computational complexity, it's quadratic, right? Because for solving a polynomial of particular degree, you need to solve a polynomial of one lower degree first. But, but if you add deflation to this, just like we did for cubics, you get a, an algorithm with exponential complexity. So don't do that. It's great for cubics. For higher order polynomials, it's not great. I believe. Theoretically, in some cases, for cortex, for fourth order polynomials, it will still pay off. But in, in practice, I've found that it's, it gets lower. So don't, don't, don't use deflation here for higher order. All right, let's look at computation times, right? I told you, high performance. Let's see if it, is, if it actually is. So here's the cubics. I'm comparing two versions of our solver here, uh, one with some lower accuracy using a larger error threshold and higher accuracy. Now, this, this yellow one is matching the accuracy of the analytical solution. And this red one is matching the accuracy of Blin's version, right? So you should compare them in terms of performance that way. I also added the regular Newton iterations here, although that, yeah, it, it, this just finds one of the roots and it's, it's not great. So, but one funny thing here, if you look at it, you see that this doesn't make much sense, right? I mean, we're using Newton iterations for these. How come Newton iterations on their own slower? That doesn't make any sense. Well, here's what's happening. The problem with just blindly applying Newton iterations is that when there is no root, you don't know. 
right? You need to iterate, and then the iteration never converges, actually, it bounces back and forth. Uh, and at some point, you, you give up when you reach the maximum number of iterations. So, like, you need to do a lot of computation to figure out that you don't have a root. Uh, but when you do have a root, actually, new to iterations are a little bit faster because it does, they don't have the overhead of our splitting and the other steps. Also, this is somewhat deceiving because um, in my experiments, about 30% of the time, these regular Newton iterations could not even find that one root. <laughs> so it might be a little bit faster, right? It doesn't even work. So don't, don't even bother with it, right? Don't, don't use it. Split first, do our version. Uh, don't even bother with, with, with this. Right. And, and you see that on average, it's uh, better in terms of both accuracy and, and performance from the analytical solvers. All right, this is, the, this is the average condition here. You see, it's significantly better, I would say. And if you compare this to quadratics degree two polynomials, you'll see that degree two is quite a bit faster. I'm saying less than 10 nanoseconds for this particular hardware that I tested on the CPU. But it can be, actually, I think it's about eight nanoseconds. But I also have an optimized, hand-optimized SIMD implementation that brings it down to about four nanoseconds on that hardware. So it can be significantly faster, right? Cubics are going to be more expensive. What happens when we go to degree four? Actually, well, it uh, costs more than doubles. Yeah, because to be able to solve at degree four, I need to flow with degree three first. For degree five, it goes uh, a little less than double. And for degree six, okay, it's, uh, you know, it's increasing, but not that much. Actually, we should probably stop here, or maybe even before, because the yeah, degree seven polynomial, I have 32 bits. I can't even properly compute the polynomial itself with good accuracy. So root finding for degree seven polynomial for 32 bits, don't do that. That's probably not a good idea. So let's move on to 64 bits. That's a much better idea. For 64 bits, I'm showing you the performance results on a graph or up to degree 10. As you can see, they're increasing sort of quadratically, but it doesn't look that bad, right? It's pretty good. Actually, the computation time depends on the error threshold you pick, right? So if you pick a smaller error threshold, of course, you're going to have to do more computation. But if you compare this to an out-of-the-box popular polynomial root finder that it's uh, used everywhere, uh, you'll see that now, now our poly in this case is sort of off the charts. That also should not give you the wrong impression. Actually, this algorithm will catch up at some point. In my experiments about degree 20 to 30, they, they start, uh, our poly becomes uh, a, a little bit faster, actually. So, but, but for low degree, uh, polynomial, lower polynomial degrees, it's actually, the solution is so much faster. Okay, I'm saying, I keep saying fast and fast. Let's put this in context with a challenge. The challenge, that I picked for that is hair rendering. I'll tell you why I picked that challenge in a little bit. So for hair rendering, we have a curve, let's say a cubic curve, and I'm going to have a circle that defines the, the size of the, the hair forming a, like I move this circle around and forming a tube like this, and I'm gonna find ray intersections with this tube, which ends up being a polynomial of degree 10. So I need to find the roots of this degree 10 polynomial. So for this problem, we're going to use our brute force polynomial root finder and see how well it does. Well, how am I going to know if it does well? The reason why I picked this problem is that actually there exists an excellent, an excellent high performance solution for this problem in the form of phantom ray hair intersector. So we're going to see how these two solutions compare and see if we can get anywhere close to it, right? So we're going to do hair rendering, but we're not going to do shading and all and everything. We just want to do ray intersections. So if we're going to render something boring like this, right? <laughs> and let's see what the results look like. For cubics, cubics. Uh, the actual numbers don't matter. So I'm going to show you the relative numbers. For brute force polynomial root finder, let's say it's 1x, right? Solving a degree 10 polynomial. If this is 1x, then phantom ray hair intersector in this case gives me 1.3x. So it's actually even faster. Yeah, about 30% faster. So that's great. Now I can do more actually. I can take these curves and make them longer by combining multiple curves into just one larger curve, like five times longer. If I do that, actually, uh, you know, phantom ray hair intersector does not like it so much. So it's performance comparatively that goes down quite a bit more. If I take this cubic 
and use a quadratic approximation of these cubics. So we had an, a paper at HPG a few years back about how to convert cubic curves to quadratic curves and how to approximate them. So if you do that, then we get a lower order polynomial because we get a lower order polynomial. This becomes so much faster. And in comparison, we get quite a bit more speed up. But of course, this is just one hair model. If you have a more straight hair model, phantom hair and gray hair intersector does a little bit better. So these numbers don't matter that much, I would say. But in the end, the point that I'm trying to make is that we get something out of the box that is sort of can be compared with a high performance solution to this problem. So that this tells me that this polynomial root finder is actually giving us really good performance, right? So that was the whole point. Actually, I got to thank here for to Alex Rashido. He ran these uh, my, my implementation uh, and compared with his sort of more optimized implementation, put in plus plus here, and and got these results. As you can see, if you keep splitting these curves and get shorter and shorter and shorter curves, uh, phantom ray hair intersector actually comparatively does a little bit better. With the original curves, maybe uh, polynomial root finder might be a little bit better. So you know, there's a, the the point is not to say that this is faster than phantom ray intersector. That's not the point. The point is that we get a solution that we could even compete with and highly optimize dedicated solution for this problem out of the box just by solving a polynomial. So that tells me this polynomial uh, solution is high performance. So if you want to test it and see how well it does in your own applications, uh, just go to my website, um, x polynomials, uh, and you will find all the documentation and the paper and everything. Uh, and uh, I have a source code, this in C++, just works like this. This is the entire code actually works. <laughs> so you can solve it, in this case, a degree five polynomial like this. Uh, so just go and try it out. It's very easy to use um, and, and see how well it does for, for, for your own problems, right? All right, with this, I would like to thank Alex first for a wonderful feedback he gave me, actually. That was, that was really amazing. Um, and also uh, many others who gave me feed, feedback along the ways in the, for the earlier versions of, of this work. And I got to thank, specifically thank the HPG, IPC, and reviewers uh, who reviewed this paper. I had one of the best reviews I've ever received in my career. So if you guys are not submitting your papers to HPG, you're missing out. I would highly recommend it. This, this was really amazing. Um, now, I would like people to know about this because I think this is an important deal. I wish somebody told me that I could solve polynomials much earlier. So I would like to <laughs> extend this idea and spread it as much as possible. Because of that, I'm also going to give a talk at SIGGRAPH this year. It's just a talk. Uh, so this is the title. I've already recorded the talk a few well, weeks ago, I guess. So it's already pre-recorded. I, I guess you'll be able to see it in, in a little bit. So with that, I, I'd like to stop here. Um, and I hope that you guys will be able to take a look at this and do it in Thank you, Jen, for the very lively uh, presentation here. It was, was fun watching. Um, Thank you. We have a bit of time for questions. And um, there is already one on the question boards. Can you, can you read this? It's about um, interval arithmetic and uh, Toth's approach. I would appreciate if you could please read them for me. Okay. I'm standing a little far from my monitor. Absolutely. So the top question, I think they're both related. I'm just going to read the top is, I was also going to bring up interval and affine methods. I imagine they would be slower in most cases, but there might be robustness advantages. The Toth approach is essentially bisection using interval arithmetic. Does that tell you anything? Bisection using interval arithmetic. Is, are you talking about regular <laughs> policy or something? I've experimented with quite a few different numerical root finders. And uh, you, you will see some of these results in the paper. I've included it, some of them in the supplemental document as well. Uh, you will see that they all perform poorly in comparison to Newton. Actually, there's a special case, one special case, really crazy special case, even for cubic, if all three roots are exactly at the same point, in that case, bisection performs a little bit faster than Newton iterations. But that, that case alone, uh, in the, all other cases, actually, uh, Newton iterations perform much better. Then everything else I've tested, including some higher order uh, solvers, 
uh, with high order uh, followers, you can actually ha get fewer iterations. You can actually find a root with fewer iterations. Yeah, you can solve a quadratic at each Newton iteration. Uh, and that reduces the number of iterations, but it increases the total computation time. So it <laughs> didn't really help. So I tried all sorts of things, and I really converged on the Newton iterations in the end. OK, thanks. There's one uh, question on the mic by Simon, if you want to ask your question directly. Yes, sorry. I Yeah, I posted the original question about um, TOF. Uh, it was a paper I, I based some ray tracing on 32 years ago. Um, so <laughs> it's what, what if I remember correctly, and it's it's again stretches stretch my memory. As far as I remember, TOF was used to find if the derivative was safe. Well, you could use it for basically I creating a bounding box around your patch or whatever. So first of all, you could do AABB messes, but then it also I think you used on the set on the first derivative to decide whether your, your Newton iteration would be well behaved. Uh -huh. So at yep. that point, you you launched into Newton and he got there very quickly. So it wasn't right. it wasn't just bisection uh, by any means. So yeah. I just wondering so if, you, if you'd like... seen it and tried it. Uh, I, but that sounds like a very similar idea to me. Uh, so that that's what I was trying to say early on in the talk. That you know, this I'm not going to tell you anything new. <laughs> 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 these are just uh, ideas that have been out there. But we just didn't know that if you put them together mm -hmm. in the right order, you get a good solution for even higher order polynomials. So I, it's, that sounds like well, a the, the very fun thing similar was, idea to me. The fun thing was that we would we were using um, revolution, so we're doing sine and cosine, so it weren't just polynomials. You could use oh, any right. sort of smooth function in there. It it right. just might be worthwhile having a look at it. I mean, God knows how old it is, but um, um, <laughs> thanks for the clarification. <laughs> and for the, for the pointer. Yeah, okay. um, yeah, thank in the you interest of time, I think we should move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Jim, again you for it. Yes, please <laughs> ask in the questions. The next talk um, will be by Alexander Reshetov, already mentioned in the talk earlier, and he has a very good application for finding roots of polynomials. The next uh, talk is entitled Ray Ribbon Intersections. So, yes, please take the stage. Ray Ribbon Intersector. This is BBC documentary on string theory. And this is my rendering of a similar model using new ribbon primitives. It runs at over 1 billion rays per second for this view. I could have used a spaghetti model, but I wanted to have something more fundamental. The new primitive is the first one that simultaneously smooths, composable, and allows direct ray intersections. This is achieved by embedding such primitives into so-called rolled surfaces. If you remember a single thing from this presentation, this is a key characteristic of the new approach. This is not enough to make smooth connections. I would have explained it right now, so you could go back to whatever multitasking you are doing. Unfortunately, it requires introducing some mathematical apparatus, so I will do it at the end of the presentation. Let me show a few models with new primitives. This is a grass model consisting of 100,000 blades, and each blade is modeled with three ribbon primitives. This is T. Cozy model from Utah guys. Some weird geometrical construct, which is called a Seifert spiral. A less weird Hilbert curve, at least for computer graphics crowd. 
In all these examples, ribbons have a customary look, something curvy, with its length significantly bigger than the width. It is not required by itself. This model consists of 10 primitives, which width is 8x of its length. So, how to model a ribbon? Let me first get rid of this annoying animation. It is convenient to define a center line of the ribbon by a sequence of points that are smoothed by the spline. We also need the ribbon orientation and the width. This allows the creation of smooth surfaces. On the other hand, if we use a degenerate sequence of points with repeated entries, we could create creases as well. There are eight ribbon primitives in this model. Modeling a triangle as a ribbon is also possible strictly for entertainment purposes. Ribbons were used in computer graphics before, mostly exploring ways how to represent different surfaces, not how to render them. Bunny was abused at least twice in this research, so I created my version modeling the shortest path of all bunny vertices with ribbons. All such models are domain-specific, though Raffaele and colleagues developed a technique to represent general surfaces using carton ribbonization. And this is another ribbonization example from 19th century. So what is a rolled surface? We know what ray is. It is a geometric object defined by parameter t and two vectors, a region O and direction D. Well, one of them is a point and another a vector, but let's not fuss about it. Let's make the origin and the direction dependent on another parameter. This will give us a bivariate surface, which is called a rule surface. Now the controversial part. What was the origin before is now called a directrix and what was direction is now called a generator. To make things even more confusing, I will use a different notation for these entities. Basically, we obtained a rule surface by dragging a generator line along a directrix. By design, for each given value of u, we get a line which completely lies in the surface. Therefore, we could immediately write an equation for ray surface intersection by setting a distance between such a line and the ray to zero. The degree of this equation for parameter u of the surface is equal to the degree of the directrix plus the degree of the generator. Here's one trivial example. By dragging a constant generator along a straight line, we will get a plane. Conversely, if the degree of the directrix is zero and the degree of the generator is one, we will get a planar sector. 
if both the generate and the directrix are linear, we will get a bilinear patch. Since we could define a ribbon everywhere in the parametric space of this patch, we choose an area close to its diagonal. We find a ribbon intersection by solving a quadratic equation. Unfortunately, such primitives do not allow much in the desired shape for the compound ribbon. In this example, we are trying to wrap the ribbon around the cone. Even if we match cone normals for the first ribbon in the sequence, subsequent ribbons will have a different orientation, which is defined by the orientation of the first ribbon. If we increase the degree of the directrix, we could easily wrap a ribbon around the cone. So we will be talking about such ribbons formed by a quadratic directrix and a linear generator. We intersect them by solving a cubic equation. And this is what we will get. Normals are smooth only at ribbon center lines. To fix it, we could use higher degree equations. There is one problem. I had already called this primitive ribbon 3. There is a better way. Directrix is a quadratic vector function and could be explicitly written as such. Now let's add to the linear generator this additional cubic term. The new generator still evaluates to B0 and B1 at endpoints. This is good, but the degree of the intersection equation appears to be 5, which is bad. In reality, though, all the higher terms of the intersection equation evaluate to zero. So we still have a cubic equation, but obtain to additional degrees of freedom. Beta and gamma, which we can use to make smooth connections. Going back to this trefoil model, we will get smooth connections everywhere except between the first and the last ribbons. This is a solvable problem. We have enough degrees of freedom, so it requires a nonlinear optimization. Here is another example of a closed ribbon. One, two, three. We now have this new primitive. Let's try to break it. This is a model consisting of four ribbons, which lengths to width ratio is 1, 2, 2. Let's stretch it by thousand times. The original model is still there, but it now has a pixel size. So far so good. Let's try a million. It looks the same because I positioned the camera using the bounding box of the model. A billion times, still good, but don't worry, we will break it soon. A trillion times. If the original ribbon length was one centimeter, this model would stretch to moon and then some. Finally, 10 trillion.
it is still important to understand what the problem is. One possible explanation is that 10 trillion has 13 zeros. But I think you have already guessed what is wrong with this model. It will become clear if we look on it from a different viewpoint. We are looking at the biggest bounding box NVIDIA hardware could represent. We could model everything on Earth and within moon orbit, but solar system as a whole is out of reach. This is the final slide raising properties of different primitives. It is way more convoluted and perhaps even controversial to discuss it in a couple of minutes. So I just will leave it here as a reference. Thank you very much. Thank you for this presentation. A reminder to the audience to please post your questions on the board if you have any. And we have plenty of time for questions. So while you all think about your questions, I have some. So I understand you used for this insane precision that you get, like solar system range precision. You only use 32-bit floating point here. Would you at all gain anything if you went to doubles, or is that now not necessary anymore? It is not necessary because after finding roots using a modified blin analytical solution, I also do some geometric adjustment using geometric properties of the model. Because if you linearize model, you could do itsy bitsy step. So double precision just will give you nothing at this point. Interesting. That's a great result. There are two more questions on the board. Let me just read the top. Uh -huh. um, have you considered using this framework for certain types of hair rendering? Uh, there is a possibility to use it using face oriented, oriented ribbons as a proxy for hair. This is definitely a possibility. But at, at this point, I am not actively pursuing it because there are other hair intersectors which are uh, like f f f fitting the problem. So there is no reason to do it. But uh, at the matter of point, if it would be possible to reduce it to quadratic equations somehow, it would be beneficial by tweaking model instead of trying to intersect offset surface, trying to do some closest point of approach simulation, something like this. So that's a possibility. I see. There's one, <laughs> there's one more. <laughs> Which primitive do you plan to study next? Uh, I kind of thinking about switching back to textures because uh, and uh, maybe doing some uh, uh, CNN uh, convolutional networks for this problem because a lot of people taking advantage in deep learning algorithms. So maybe I, I will look into something. Uh, this point of view of primitives, if you look at my last slide, there are good candidates, for example, for quartic equations, and you could uh, plug and play gem uh, polynomial solver for this kind of problems. And for uh, quartic polynomials, I think you could even get away with singles, which might be interesting to see how it will look like. And just side note, I experimented with Jen's system, uh, implemented it in my test bed, and 
I appreciate it even much, even more when I looked into how code is written. There is excellent documentation, so it's great. That's and good to hear. Yeah, and it's it's quite rare when you read something and then see how it is implemented, and you still like it. So it's, it's pretty good, pretty good code. Very good, high praise. Nice. Are there any more questions? If that is not the case, I think we can move on to the next talk a little early even. Thanks again for answering our questions. Mm. So the last presentation in today's session is entitled h tags per half edge texturing for arbitrary mesh topologies. And it's work by Villain Barbier and Jonathan Dupuis, both from Unity. And it's a, a better p text for as much as I understand. And I'm curious to hear the presentation. Hi, I am William Barbier. And today I'm going to present HTEC, our novel GPU-friendly texturing algorithm for arbitrary meshes that is based on half edges. Before I describe our method, I would like to start with some motivation for this work. Nowadays, painting software such as Substance Painter or Mudbox are widespread. Their key feature is to allow artists to intuitively texture their assets by directly painting on the mesh surface. The main motivation behind EdgeTech is to provide the ability to drag and drop any mesh in such software so that you can immediately start painting without any additional steps. The key to make this work is the texturing method, which will allow us to map textiles onto the mesh surface. And of course, in order to guarantee interactive frame rates, we also want this method to map entirely on the GPU. With this in mind, the first candidate we can look at is UV mapping. UV mapping works by unfolding the mesh onto a quad that is then associated with a texture, as shown in the middle here. This method is ubiquitous as it is supported everywhere. However, it does have a few drawbacks. First, the UV map is usually created manually by artists, which is a tedious process. And actually, at Unity, UV unwrapping is what our artists hate the most, and this is probably a very widespread feeling. Another issue is that UV mapping is discontinuous by nature. This means that it systematically results in quacks with displacement maps, as shown on the right here. Our second texturing candidate is PTEC, which is Disney's standard texturing method. Let's zoom into the blue area to see how it works. The idea is simple. Rather than using a single texture for the entire mesh, use one texture for each face of the mesh. This results in the following parameterization. The key feature of PTEC is that it is fully automatic. Since it directly builds upon the faces of the mesh, it frees artists from any kind of UV authoring while also guaranteeing continuous texturing results over the entire mesh as opposed to UV mapping. Despite these advantages, PTEC turns out to be problematic for certain types of meshes. To illustrate this problem, let's have a look at another part of the mesh. In this area, the mesh is mostly composed of quads, but it also carries a triangle shown in green. Now, if you have one texture per face, it's not clear how to handle such topology. The key problem here is that we want to apply square textures on non-quad topologies, and this is very difficult to do. In practice, PTEC splits non-quad faces in quad subfaces. Unfortunately, this introduces complexity in the filtering code, which translates into branching on the GPU that hurts performance. Due to this issue, GPU implementations of PTEC are usually restricted to quad-only meshes. In this work, we introduce a novel quadrangulation that allows to map square textures on the surface of any topological configuration. And here is the quadrangulation we derive, thanks to our contributions, which lie at the foundation of HTEC. The resulting parameterization may look a bit complex at first sight. However, it is actually very simple to build and requires no additional data other than that of a half edge mesh. And actually, it is so simple that I can already summarize our entire approach in a few slides that I hope you can take away from this talk. And here we go. We start from the input mesh shown here. And the primitives that HTEC builds upon are the half edges, which are usually drawn as the little arrow shown here. 
For those of you who are not familiar with half edges, I will provide more detail about them later. But here, I want to provide our key insight, which is that half edges actually encode a triangulation of the mesh, where each half edge maps to one triangle as follows. The other key property is that this particular triangulation leads to a quadrangulation that is well suited to the problem of texturing. We obtain this quadrangulation by merging pairs of triangles that share a common edge of the original mesh, like so. The resulting quadrangulation is what we use as our base primitive for texturing, as shown in the orange inset here. Thanks to HTEC, we now have a GPU-friendly solution that provides the best of both worlds between UV maps and PTEC. In the remainder of this talk, I will describe in more detail how we build HTEC, which we can summarize as the following four main blocks, the input mesh, the half edges, the triangulation, and the quadrangulation. Let's start by providing more details on the half-edge data structure. Half-edges are a data structure that encodes the connectivity of a mesh. The half-edges are this arrow that you see here. And on the right, we have the operators that are applied to the half-edges to query adjacency information of the mesh. And now I will go through these operators one by one. First, we have the twin operator, which gives us the opposite half-edge. The next operator gives us the next half-edge in the face. The prev operator gives us the previous half edge in the face. The verge operator gives us the vertex that carries the half edge. The edge operator gives us the edge spanned by the half edge. And the face operator gives us the face that contains the half edge. All of these operators allow us to query adjacency information of the mesh, and they are going to be useful for filtering. To use this data structure in practice, we need a GPU implementation. To represent a mesh, such as the one shown on the left, we use two buffers. First, a vertex buffer that stores the positions of the vertices. And second, a half-edge buffer that stores the half-edge data structure. Here, you see that each row corresponds to one operator, and each column corresponds to one half-edge. If you look at the half-edge 7 highlighted in blue here, we see that its twin half-edge is a half-edge 1, and we can find this information here in our half-edge buffer. Another example, if we want to find the next half edge of the half edge 7, which is half edge 8, we just have to look it up in our half edge buffer here. As you can see, all the half edge operators are implemented simply as a lookup in an array. Now that you have the half edges, we are going to see how they encode the triangulation of the mesh. On the left here is our input mesh, and on the right is the corresponding triangulation. And I'm going to show you this is how this triangulation is defined, by taking the example of the blue half edge here. The first vertex of the corresponding triangle is shown in red here, and is just the vertex of the half edge. The second vertex, shown in green here, is the vertex of the next half edge. And the third vertex, shown in orange, is the very center of the face that contains the half edge. We obtain the blue triangle here, and if we do the same thing with all the half edges, we get the following triangulation where each half edge maps to one triangle. This triangulation has a very nice property that I'm going to illustrate by applying the half edge operators to the blue half edge. So first, we have the twin half edge shown in red, the previous half edge shown in orange, and the next half edge shown in green. And we see that the neighbors of any triangle can be queried using the half edge operators. This is a very useful property that we will use in our filtering algorithm. To sum up, we have shown that the half edges encode a triangulation of the input mesh. This means that we don't need to store this triangulation, since it is given by the half edges. Additionally, we can find the neighbors of any triangle of this triangulation using the half edge operators. Now, I am going to show you how we build a quadrangulation from this triangulation. Our starting point is the triangulation that I just described. To build our quadrangulation, we merge triangles that correspond to twin half edges. Or, another way to see it, is that we merge triangles that share an edge of the input mesh. This gives us this quadrangulation, where each edge of the input mesh maps to one quad of our quadrangulation. And once again, this is directly encoded by the half edges, so we don't need to store it. A useful property of this construction is that since half edges map to triangles, 
and edges map to quads, we can know which quad contains any triangle by applying the edge operator. Now that we have our quadrangulation, we can simply do the same thing as PTEC and store one texture for each quad, like this. This way, we are able to texture our model, which has triangles, quad and end guns, without defining texture coordinates. And now, I'm going to show you how we handle meshes with boundaries. The triangulation step is exactly the same, it doesn't change here. For the quadrangulation step, we are still going to merge together triangles that share an edge of the input mesh, which gives us this result here. You see here that interior edges of the input mesh map to quads and boundary edges map to triangles. And we texture our model by associating one texture with each of these quads or triangles. And to avoid filtering artifacts, we mirror the textures for the boundary edges. This means that we waste 50% of the memory for these boundary edges, but they are a small minority, so in practice it is negligible. And now that we've seen how edge tech textures are defined, I'm going to explain how to use them inside a rendering pipeline. And I'm going to compare EdgeTech with borderless PTEC, which is a state-of-the-art GPU implementation of PTEC. Borderless PTEC works only with quad meshes, and it works by drawing the faces of the mesh. The information that it needs to do a texture lookup is the index of the face and the position inside the face. To have seamless filtering, it also takes as input the list of adjacent faces. As a result, we get a textured quad. With HTEC, we draw the triangles that are given by the triangulation that I described. To do a texture lookup, we need the index of the current half edge, which is also the index of the triangle, and the barycentric coordinates inside the triangle. To have seamless filtering, we use the half edge data structure for adjacency queries, and our output is a textured triangle. And now, I'm going to show you our filtering algorithm. As you will see, it is very simple and fits on this slide. Here, we are drawing the blue triangle, and we want to integrate the texture under this footprint. We first query the neighbors of the blue triangle using the half edge operators next and prev. Then, we do a first texture fetch for the quad that contains the blue triangle. The hardware filtering unit integrates the part of the footprint that lies inside of this quad. Then, we do another texture fetch for the quad that contains our first neighbor. Here, it returns zero because the quad doesn't intersect the footprint. And we do a last texture fetch for the quad that contains the other neighbor. And that's it. With just three texture fetches, we get seamless filtering. And as you can see, the code is very simple and consists of the half edge operators, of texture fetches, and of this small function triangle to quad uv that transform the point from the coordinates of the triangle to the quad, and is also only a few lines. And all of it fits on the slide. And now, I'm going to compare our algorithm with the algorithm used by borderless PTEC, which is quite similar. Here, the setup is identical. We are drawing the quad in blue, and we want to integrate the texture inside the red footprint. To do this, we are first going to fetch the texture of the center quad, and then fetch the textures of each of the neighbors. Borderless PTEC requires in total 5 texture fetches, while EdgeTech only needs 3. And now, I am going to show some results. The main achievement of our algorithm is that it works natively with meshes of arbitrary topologies. For example, this mesh here has both triangle and quads. Our algorithm is also compatible with hardware and isotropic filtering, as you can see here. HTEC also enables crack-free displacement. Here is a demo of a production asset rendered with displacement mapping and adaptive tessellation using HTEC. And here, we render another asset with displacement mapping using both edge tech and traditional UV, traditional UV mapping. As you can see, UV mapping introduces cracks in the displaced surface, while edge tech remains crack-free. Now, let's talk about performance. 
we did a first comparison between HTEC and borderless PTEC with both a single albedo texture and with an additional displacement texture. In both cases, we find that HTEC is faster. We also compared HTEC with UV mapping. We find that HTEC is slower because of the additional memory accesses and texture fetches, but it remains in the same ballpark and achieves real time performance by far. To conclude, we presented our novel texturing algorithm that is based on a half fetch data structure and works natively with meshes of arbitrary topologies. If you are interested, you can find the code at this address shown here. And I would like to end this talk with an open ended question. You might have noticed that our filtering algorithm only uses the properties of our triangulation. The quadrangulation is actually only needed because the hardware texture unit works with square textures. If we had some kind of triangular texture unit, we could simply store one texture per triangle of our triangulation, which would both simplify the algorithm and remove the memory waste at the boundary. We think that this is a neat idea, and we would be interested in hearing about other original use cases for a triangular texture unit. So that's all for me, thank you for listening, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you for the presentation. And we have plenty of time for questions. There's one already on the board. Is our speaker here? Oh, both of them. Hello. Yes. So, the, so, so I, do I read the question or you are already read it? Uh, I can. OK, so the question was, what kind of artifacts might result from, with triangles that contain long and skinny triangles, and right. how, how do you deal with them? And so uh, the artifacts that you might get are uh, anisotropic texels, which lead to distortion. Uh, so this is an issue. This can be an issue, but it's an issue with all uh, of the methods that are similar, like uh, PTEC or mesh colors, that, uh, that are dependent on the topology uh, of the mesh. So if you have uh, a mesh with uh, low quality that has uh, elongated faces or skinny triangles, you might get uh, distortion issues. Uh, like this. Maybe let me ask a follow up here. What happens if you encounter that during animation? Can you always avoid this? You would need to like rebake all the textures to avoid all the the squashed mm. parametrization. The parametrization, uh, oh, um, well, we hmm, we don't uh, we don't change the parametrization with the with the animation uh, unless the topology changes with the animation, uh, but uh, since our uh, our parametrization is built upon the topology. If you have just a skin mesh where the topology do doesn't change, then our parametrization stays fixed. So if you have triangles that are uh, that uh, become skinny with the animation, that uh, stretch or squash, you might see uh, some uh, some artifacts uh, caused by this. Right. Thanks. There's one more question. How do you pack the quad textures? Is there a border? And if so, how does that interact with anisotropic sure. filtering? So we don't pack the quad textures. Uh, we use bindless textures. So for each quad, we, we have a one texture. And uh, bindless textures allow, this, allow us to uh, fetch basically any of those uh, at runtime. Uh, so we don't need to pack them, which means that uh, we get an, an isotropic filtering uh, for free. We don't, we don't uh, have any kind of seam artifacts with an isotropic filtering that can result when you pack your, all your textures in, in a single class. Uh, and I think another part was, uh, uh, well, th so we don't need any borders uh, either. We don't pack the textures. Right. So, I, so actually we use, uh, we actually use the hardware uh, 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 texture you need to compute the border that gives us uh, a weight for each texture tap. And we then blend the three uh, texture taps all together using this blending weight, similar to what is done in uh, borderless PTEC. That makes sense. Thank you. There's one more question. If you have multiple LODs for a mesh, is it possible to reuse the same texture storage? I don't, not in the general case, at least maybe, maybe in some special cases, but uh, I don't think uh, we haven't investigated it, but uh, not simply at least. Seems like uh, a hard one. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's really you really need to see HTech like a, a P Tech uh, alternative. So you're really tied to the topology of the mesh. So if whenever you change the topology, you have diff a different set of textures. So obviously, if you use uh, discrete LEDs, you have different topologies. So you have a different set of textures. Okay, right. That makes sense. So you'll just have multiple meshes along with multiple textures, right? Yes. So one, one thing maybe that uh, could be useful is that in general, if, if you apply the same uh, P-Tech pipeline, what usually happens is that artists paint on uh, a control cage that is used as input for subdivision surfaces. So it usually is a, U poly, uh, a low poly mesh, and you can, you can actually compute the discrete LODs from this uh, low poly mesh to the more refined version of the sub-D. Right. You're using the actual same set of textures. One thing you can't do is decimate the mesh and reduce the textures. That would be more complex. I see. So you're saying at least the authoring step would be done once, yes. and then you'd reuse that. Yeah. I see. Andrew, is that the mic, if you want to ask your um, question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I just wanted to follow up on that last point that you said, Jonathan. Uh, if you were to author on a sort of a control cage or a, a decimated version of the mesh from which all the other LODs are derived, would then your method have to be modified to support like groups of triangles rather than single triangles or the or the quadrangulation is somewhat independently computed? No, this, uh, you, you can really, uh, HTEC supports any topology. So uh, you can just give it any, anything you want to, uh, as input, but like you, as you asked in the, as you during your first question, if you have really a, a poor quality mesh, then the texels will be highly anisotropic, and you'll have poor texel distribution on the surface uh, of the mesh. Okay, thank you. Great work. Thanks. Still plenty of time. There's one more. This is more of a comment on the question yeah. board. We're loading the link right now. <laughs> Texture mapping progressive meshes. Have you read this paper? No. <laughs> me, not me. Okay. <laughs> but uh, we will investigate. Discuss. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you, uh, Vasco. Thank you very much for the link. I have one more quick question. Maybe can you comment on the storage overhead for the mesh itself? It seems like you're storing what, like six index buffers for each half edge. Is that more than a regular vertex index triangular mesh? Yeah, that's it. It's exactly what you said. Like okay. you can you can really see it as a index, a vertex buffer, the same vertex buffer, and an index buffer. But instead of having a single integer per index, you have six. Okay, and you store these full thirty-two bits. And is there a yes a way? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I think I have no further question. Are there any more from the audience? Maybe. That does not seem to be the case. So thank you two again for answering our questions. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We are continuing with geometry in another eight minutes or so. There will be the high performance geometry panel and we can all <laughs> two minutes of break now. Thank you all. Oh, I was going to just announce that. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I thought you were in this session and were kind of busy and <laughs> unable to do this. Thank things. you for doing that. Yes, HPG is not done. Today, we're going to have a little bit of a longer stream. Uh, and our next event is going to be the, the panel on high performance geometry. It's going to start in eight minutes. So we're going to have a little bit of a short break. Well, and so if you're watching this on Twitch or YouTube, stay online. You know, our panel is going to be there. If you are on OEA, I am going to be in the social rooms, and um, I invite all of the authors of this session to be in the social rooms as well to answer any additional questions that uh, you guys might have. So see you all in there, and eight minutes back here. <laughs> Bye.
Hi, everyone, and welcome back to HPG 2022. Uh, we now have the panel for this year uh, HPG. And the topic we chose this year uh, with my uh, program co-chair, Hanjo, is entitled High Performance Geometry. And we invited a group of people that we believe are experts on the topic from content creation all the way down to final high performance rendering. Those people who have accepted to participate to this panel and to discuss and exchange their perspective on the topic are Henry Morton from NVIDIA, Jonathan Dupuis from Unity, Ryan Schmidt from Epic, David Farrell from Adobe, and Alex Evans from NVIDIA. And right now we'll have a session split in two. Essentially, during five minutes, each of our panelists will give their perspective on, uh, on the question. And after we'll have a discussion uh, around this, uh, this question of geometry, high performance rendering, and how to, to combine both. One aspect we wanted to emphasize with, uh, with Anjul was to revisit the standards and uh, think about like what kind of uh, new representation could emerge in the near future. And so we asked the panelists to think about uh, two controversial questions uh, that we asked them. Uh, the first one is, is there a realistic path to uv less graphics and therefore are 2D textures dead? And that echoes a little bit the, some of the talk we saw today, uh, in particular the one we just saw at the technical paper session. And the second question was, assuming 2D textures are dead, then are triangle meshes dead too? And so they have the, the choice to explicitly answer those questions or just give their perspective on uh, high performance geometry. The first speaker will be Henry Morton. Uh, the mic is yours. Oh, great. Thanks very much. So um, let's see. Uh, I'm still learning how to do this, obviously. All right. So um, as I said on the on the title slide, I'm giving a hardware perspective, you know, in some sense with a question mark because my background is in software for although over a long career, I've, you know, sort of migrated toward doing hardware design. Um, as Tammy just said, the, there was this interesting question around, you know, where are things going to go? And the first one seemed to imply that if you get rid of UVs, you get rid of textures. And I created all of this slide pretty obviously before the the talk that was just given about HTEx. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of a path forward without UVs, it's some variant of HTEx. And to, to use that or to get rid of UVs, basically, you need something to provide um, texture coordinates basically through some kind of inherent parameterization. So NURBs, subDs, um, all of these things probably need some amount of aggregation to get the kind of levels of efficiency that you might need. Um, and these are all kind of descendants of both rays and ironically a, a disaster of a product, um, NV1 uh, from NVIDIA. Um, so, uh, but what about meshes? I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting to look at is, especially with photogrammetry, many meshes have become what I refer to as triangle dust. There's this bust I pulled off of the Smithsonian site. They have a nice scan repository that's 27 million triangles. So, you know, triangle meshes are universal, but they're um, painfully inefficient. Kind of as a result of that, though, they're, you know, the, of this insanely high resolution, there is a huge amount of redundance. You know, their high quality means that they're really, really smooth, um, you know, when they're smooth. I mean, occasionally you have sharp corners in the mesh, sure. Normals are probably redundant because the geometry itself captures the, the uh, surface itself. And they're absurdly local, uh, meaning that all of the vertices are very close to each other. And obviously we've seen in, in the last couple of years, folks very much exploiting this, um, but hanging on to their UVs and using conventional textures. Kind of in the context of this whole question of you know whether meshes survive there's there are some issues in terms of you know for specifically for huge meshes rasterization is linear so you've got to have level of detail because it's got to be screen space dependent otherwise you're going to die uh you know you'll it'll really hurt your performance ray tracing is logarithmic but 
to ray trace, you need to be BVH and the BVH build is linear and the space is linear. So there's some serious things to overcome here if you want to go to very, very high quality, high resolution meshes. And then there's animation to just further complicate matters. But what do we really want to do? I mean, like, what's the goal here? Um, you know, I heard Aaron Lafon at various points talk about, you know, wanting to, to produce photorealism. And, and I think as an industry, to some degree, we want to not just render things, we want to simulate them, um, you know, simulate reality. And you can't even, it's, it's utterly, you know, infeasible to think about authoring things, about, you know, armies of artists creating stuff. Um, and, you know, getting back to this animation question, some of it's also going to move. So like, what are the alternatives if you can't actually sit down and create everything? You need, you know, procedural methods, neural methods, you know, sort of higher level primitives that allow you to, um, to actually synthesize geometry. I mean, like this picture on the right has got lovely complexity um, in terms of near field, far field, um, where the details are. And, and all of this seems to boil down to, you know, kind of a, a question of efficiency if you want to render this stuff um, in real time. You can imagine neural methods for a field of grass, but once you get close to the blades, you need some kind of hard geometry. And I guess another thing, and I'll touch a little bit more on this later, you know, we're not going to get, uh, probably not going to get uh, doublings of performance over the next n years. So are these higher level descriptions sufficient for the current scene or do we need some sort of caching system? And if you do, okay, what form do those things take? Um, you know, so to get onto the second question, are triangle meshes dead too? Well, as a medium for creation, I hope it's clear that they're horrible. Um, at, at the same time, well, horrible, maybe it's a little strong. Lots of people still um, push triangles around. As a representation, it's pretty basic, it's universal, and they're actually, you know, at, at, at the down at the transistor level, they're very efficient. Um, so maybe as a cached representation, they're gonna have to stay around for a long time. Um, you touched on sort of API and this whole question of putting things in hardware, whatever it might be. And I want to emphasize something that, you know, periodically frustrates me is that, you know, hardware isn't magic. It's not a silver bullet. You know, hardware versus software doesn't change comp computational complexity. Um, though if you can afford the gates, um, you know, sometimes brute force is, you know, if you can get greater efficiency by, by building custom, custom hardware, then good things can happen. But then there's this question more broadly about introducing something new. Um, and I'm particularly sensitive to this. And I actually had some variant of this slide, I think 10 or 15 years ago on a panel at HPG in LA, although maybe it wasn't called HPG at that point. But, um, I termed it legacy lag. It's basically, there's a huge amount of uh, customers and hardware out there in the world that people target. So if we look at DX12, it's um, at 90%, has sort of a 90% install base right now um, after seven years. DXR, you can look at the Steam survey. I didn't dig into it too far, but um, something less than half the GPUs out there are very ray tracing capable and I'm, it's a little bit of a uh, a negative comment about all of the hardware that's out there because I don't think all of it is, you know, it says it's capable, but it's actually not. Um, so, you know, as a company, how do we think about making architectural investments where you might say that's a hardware investment? You know, as a, as a company, we sell GPUs. That's the idea. It's like how we make money. Um, legacy game performance drives sales. That means you need to have faster GPUs and the legacy stuff doesn't use the new thing that you want to put in this new piece of hardware. At the same time, you know, revolutionary tech, revolutionary tech can drive sales with, with customers. Some people do buy something because it does something new, even though there's very little out there that actually uses it. And then I guess also to understand is over half of our market at this point is non-gaming. Um, so, and then there's this problem that game developers also have to target a market 
and that market at the time something is launched, new piece of hardware is launched, is the existing installed base that doesn't use this new thing. And again, thankfully, there are game developers out there and you know developers in general who are really interested in new tech. Um, and then there are these other effects like, oh yeah, if you actually want to get this thing to be used across the industry, you need standards. And lastly, the console business has a huge effect on what game developers in particular will pick up. If it's in a console, it gets used. So um, I think this is probably my last slide and I guess encourage people to look at this a little bit because it's interesting. There's a great talk um, by Jim Keller. Um, it was a talk given at Berkeley called Merge Law is Not Dead. Um, but what we're experiencing these days, at least based on the current ideas and the current technologies, is you can get more transistors, but they cost at least the same amount, if not more. So you can't, I mean, for the last like 30, 35 years that I've been doing this, um, you know, we had this huge ride from technology where we got a doubling of performance and we're not getting it anymore. So you've got to do more specialized and kind of targeted hardware. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Henry. The second speaker is Jonathan Dupuy from Unity. Muted. I'm not muting anymore. So here I am. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'll continue. So I'll just uh, start again with the, the questions we were asked. So is there a realistic path to UV-less graphics and therefore are 2D textures dead? And assuming 2D textures are dead, then are triangle meshes dead too? So I actually, when thinking about this presentation, I broke down these questions into essentially two parts. There's this red part, is there a realistic path to UV-less graphics? And then the rest of it is a bit, is more or less related to death. So I separated it <laughs> for uh, a later discussion. So let's start with this first uh, section. Is there a realistic path to UV-less graphics? So when we talk about UV-less graphic, my understanding is to look at what we mostly have in mind, especially at Unity, is if you want to texture uh, a polygon mesh, uh, so cover it with uh, some surface attributes, you'll need a UV map where you're asking your artists to unfold the mesh into a quad domain, and this quad is discretized into a texture that is sampled uh, from the hardware. And unfortunately, as uh, William said uh, during uh, our uh, HTEC presentation, this is super tedious for us, and it's uh, uh, it produces discontinuities that are very hard to handle, especially if you're doing displacement mapping. Um, another, th another thing that William mentioned in his introduction was that artists at Unity hated doing UV mapping, and I actually conducted uh, an internal survey among uh, some uh, artists, we have uh, colleagues of mine, Sechi. And yeah, so they unanimously don't like it, to say the least. And one thing that was uh, uh, interesting, I thought, was that uh, Sébastien Lachamp, who's a, a tech artist uh, who's working in Paris, also told me something that I hadn't necessarily realized, is that he's, he's currently dealing with uh, super high poly meshes uh, that uh, count up to millions of polygons, and he's he has to do the UVs by hand. So he has to place uh, millions of vertices by hand in his square domain. It's huge, it's a huge amount of work. So given that artists usually don't like this, there's room for technological innovation because you can expect some adoption because you already know that the artists, the, the guys who are responsible for content creation will probably at least have a look at it. And I really want to insist that this is actually a real a uh, questioning I had, and Alex uh, made this joke that I, I thought was funny because it, it, it really is true that their sentences look like Yelp reviews, but there are real answers, I can assure you that. Um, the other point I want to make is that actually UV-less graphics already exists, uh, not on the GPU, but in uh, production. So there's uh, PTEC, that is actually Disney's uh, standard texturing method, and it's really used everywhere. So just uh, as a quick reminder, you have this uh, quad, uh, quad only mesh and you apply a texture to each one of these uh, faces. And these are slides that I took from uh, Brent's uh, uh, 
uh, Brent Burley's uh, uh, slides from the uh, PTEC presentation. And one thing he, intested, he uh, insisted on was that the artists were really keen on this, on this uh, particular technique. And we are actually in, the re in research uh, pretty familiar with this uh, representation because we recently had the uh, Marana uh, Island that is made out of quads and uh, PTEC textures. Uh, so this is a close-up of a specific area of the scene, and every square here corresponds to a PTEC texture, so a unique texture that has to be applied on the uh, on the surface. Um, one also interesting fact is that actually, well, maybe Henry will uh, contradict me here, but it's uh, as far as I remember, um, I think Henry was pretty keen on pushing this particular extension which allows you to sample the uh, texture, not at the usual textual location, but at their dual location. And this would allow you to do some, uh, some mesh color filtering or PTEC-like uh, implementation. And uh, a quick mention also about non-quant meshes. So um, most of the times for production assets, artists are used to uh, create quad only meshes, but sometimes they'll add a few triangles here and there to complete their mesh. And if you have that, then how do you how do you how do you deal with that? So one solution is to use HTEC, which is the paper uh, uh, we presented just before. Or you could also use mesh colors. Um, both solutions are viable. I would uh, only say that uh, HTEC currently maps better to uh, current hardware units than mesh colors. But this again is something that is constantly evolving. So who knows? Maybe in the future there will be both uh, so both viable solutions. Uh, I'll skip this for now. So yeah, uh, so is there a realistic path to UV less graphics? My answer is uh, yes, definitely. So PTEC is a proof of concept. It's used again everywhere for every Disney production from modeling to uh, the final render. So then I'll move on to the question, are 2D textures dead? So I think that there's um, like some sort of um, confusion here is, well, you can think of textures as the thing we see on the left here, which is essentially an, uh, the, the view that an artist would, would have. And then there are additional formats. So here on the right, I'm showing the HTIC format, which is a tight body format. And um, it's not that uncommon if you're a, a developer uh, coding a game engine, because you've probably written a virtual texturing system, and you're already dealing with these texture tiles. So there's a direct, there's, uh, I'd say, an overload between 2D textures from the artist pers perspective and the, uh, what the actual engine will support and uh, use for fast rendering. Uh, so yeah, are 2D textures dead? I don't think so. It's just that we're forking, well, we are, uh, we've overloaded the word and there's a view from the artist perspective who's used to the UV-based workflow and the game engine developer who thinks of it of styles of memory that he can move around from disk to memory to G, uh, graphics RAM, etc. And then the final question is, is assuming two textures are there, then are triangle meshes there too? So for this, again, I'll insist on this uh, overload, uh, overloading uh, effect where uh, what ha usually happens is artists usually deal with quite only meshes, but then if you look at the state uh, of the art rendering uh, technology like Nanite, for example, you can see that they, they're rendering super high quality uh, geometry, but they're made of triangles. But if you're an artist and you're modeling uh, some, uh, some assets, you'll be dealing with quad only. Only what, he see, the, what your artist will see on the screen is pure triangles. It's only abstracted away. He does, he's not aware of it, but he can manipulate what he's seeing on the screen intuitively to produce the content he wants. So uh, yeah, our triangle mesh is dead. Two, I think that at user level, if you're an artist, they're definitely dead. You don't, you don't ever consider triangles. It's uh, highly discouraged. Uh, but at hardware level, we still have our good old uh, triangles that we can rasterize and ray trace super efficiently. And yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. The next speaker is Ryan Schmidt from Epic. having me um, and uh, okay let's get started so hyper we're, we're here at the high performance geometry panel um, and our questions that were posed to us uh, were is there a realistic path to UV list graphics 
Uh, I think, you know, there is a realistic path. We've just heard two people explain lots of options. There's, you know, lots of other things out there too, like distance fields and nerfs and all sorts of things uh, that don't have UVs that are sort of coming in the future. Uh, so then the second question was, therefore, are 2D textures dead or are triangle meshes dead too? Uh, and my answer is no, they're not. Um, now I'm a bit biased because uh, in my sort of work at Epic, what I do is I make modeling tools for modeling with triangle meshes specifically. So even not quads, just triangles. Um, but essentially, uh, my the reason I say no, uh, a hard no, is that geometry representations never die. So we have triangles now, we'll have triangles forever. Uh, I said we're building modeling tools in uh, Unreal Editor. We're building sort of triangle-based modeling tools. And the question that I keep getting asked probably on a monthly basis, is if we're going to support NURBS modeling. Now, a lot of people in graphics research might think NURBS modeling is dead, but millions of people in the world do NURBS modeling via CAD software. Um, and so it's still you know, alive and well, NURBS modeling, and will also probably, probably be with us forever. Um, an interesting thing about NURBS, though, is that uh, most of us have probably never seen a NURBS surface. We know what it is, but we've never seen one because they're always rendered as triangles. So a uh, sort of realization I came to some years ago was that essentially NURBS, the sort of math formalism, is a user interface for creating a triangle mesh. Uh, similarly, tools like ZBrush, which have a sort of amazing hierarchical multi-resolution sub-D representation, um, is ultimately, in most contexts, converted to a triangle mesh on export uh, into some other software. So you could also think of ZBrush as a user interface for creating a triangle mesh. And basically, all DCC tools, because they go downstream to renderers that render triangles, uh, sort of ultimately become a user interface for tri creating triangle meshes. Um, or you know maybe quad meshes, as was just mentioned. But those quads usually get rendered as triangles. <laughs> uh, and you, know, you might feel that you never interact with those triangles. But in fact, uh, I can tell you from having made triangle mesh modeling software for the past mm, 10 to 15 years, that there's a lot of people out there interacting with those triangles directly. Uh, I'm going to borrow a slide from Brian Karras, who's going to be a keynote speaker at the SIGGRAPH uh, event in August. Uh, this is a slide from one of his other talks about Nanite. And I really like this slide. He said, triangles are the foundation of computer graphics for good reason. Uh, here are some of those reasons. Uh, you know, triangle meshes are trivial to read and write and process. We basically all understand them uh, very quickly. Even non-experts can understand a list of 3D positions and a list of indices that are collected into sort of tuples where each one defines a triangle. Uh, you can write them out by hand. You can uh, create them manually uh, sort of by typing in numbers. That's all sort of plausible with triangle meshes. Uh, we also have extremely well-developed math for triangle meshes. So there's sort of stuff you know, that is very common, like things like barycentric coordinates and barycentric math, but also more advanced things like Laplacians and discrete, ex discrete exterior calculus are far more developed for triangle meshes than they are for any other representation. And those math formalisms allow us to do operations on those triangle meshes that start to be hard if you don't have them available. And of course, uh, we have amazing hardware support for rendering triangle meshes. Uh, texture maps, also trivial to read, write, process. They're just images. There's a, you know, a million image libraries out there. You can use simple formats to represent pixels as a list of three floats. Uh, they're easy for non-experts to understand, again, and to create and edit all the same things you can kind of say about triangle meshes. Uh, they also have extremely well-developed math. Again, things for image processing and filtering and all sorts of good stuff. Uh, and they also have amazing hardware support, both for rendering in 2D and for rendering in 3D as part of texture map triangle meshes. Uh, and I would argue that this stack is very efficient and flexible. Um, you know, that you could argue about inefficiency in some ways or inflexibility in other ways. But what I can tell you from observing uh, over the past few years I worked at Epic, observing our in-house artists and tech artists sort of use and abuse texture map triangle meshes, they can do amazing things with them uh, that start to become very hard to imagine how they will do those same kind of things as efficiently uh, on the sort of some of the other representations that are out there. Uh, and yes, UVs, they're annoying, but they're also great. You can do all sorts of horrible UV tricks. Uh, UV maps give you a sort of decoupling. Essentially, UV maps allow you to decouple these meshes and texture maps. And that decoupling 
is one of the sort of great flexible points in terms of flexibility for this sort of stack of, of things that we use so heavily in computer graphics. So basically, uh, my feeling is that the texture map triangle, is it's become, you know, over the past decades, the closest 3D analog we have to the 2D pixel. Some people are not going to agree with that. Um, but the reason I say that, it's basically our most basic building block for 3D geometry. Uh, sorry, voxels. Uh, voxels aren't the 3D analog to a 2D pixel, as far as I'm concerned. Happy to happy to further discuss. Uh, nobody asks if pixels are dead. So that, you know, in the same way, I don't think texture map triangles will ever be dead. Uh, of course, other things are great too. So, you know, artists will ultimately use whatever tool best suits the job. And, you know, someday that might be an, an SDF or an implicit or a nerf or, a, you know, a PTEX textured quad mesh. And that is that case already in certain contexts. Uh, and I hope that happens because, you know, I started out as an implicit surface person many years ago. Um, we use SDFs all the time uh, in terms for processing meshes. It'd be great if they were all equally well supported by hardware and all of the math was equally fully developed for all of them and they were all as sort of easily interchangeable. Um, but, you know, texture map mesh technology is not standing still. So this is a screenshot from uh, our Matrix Awakens demo that uh, was released um, earlier in the year. Uh, right, this is on screen at least hundreds of millions and possibly even billions of triangles, instanced triangles. Um, and it's part of an enormous city, uh, several kilometers square. Um, and all these buildings are triangles being streamed in and out of the GPU, texture map triangles. Um, and so far, I think we've yet to see, uh, this is all rendered with Nanite and with Lumen, our the sort of Unreal Engine 5 global illumination uh, system. Uh, real-time global illumination. And I think, and I'm happy to be told I'm wrong, that uh, in terms of real-time, you know, 30 to 60 frames a second graphics, the other available representations out there aren't able to achieve this sort of scale yet. And like I said, I hope they do. Um, but that's uh, the end of my little talk here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ryan. The next, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The next uh, presenter is David Farrell from Adobe. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, okay. Uh, my name is uh, David Farrell. I'm a software engineer at Adobe. Um, and so for this panel, we want to discuss. Uh, high performance geometry and trying to answer a couple of questions. Are 2D textures dead? And are triangle me uh, meshes dead too? Uh, and so I'd like to use the, um, the application I've been working on uh, as kind of a case study to help answer these questions and, and share my perspective. Uh, so I, oops, let's see, there we go. So um, I work on something called Adobe Substance 3D Modeler, which is uh, currently in beta and uh, is just um, uh, was, was just released earlier this year as a beta. Uh, it's a sculpting and modeling application, um, and uh, it's what we call a hybrid application. Uh, and by that, we mean that it runs in both the 2D desktop mode, where you use a keyboard, mouse, and pin input, as well as in VR mode, uh, where you can use uh, six off controllers to uh, gesturally sculpt and model. VR mode isn't required for this program. Uh, it runs just fine with uh, with just uh, desktop um, input devices. But if you have a headset, you can switch back and forth uh, between VR and desktop uh, whenever you want. Um, so here's some art uh, made with a uh, modeler. These are actually, to be fair, uh, these are made with uh, external renderers, but these, these scenes were made from within modeler. Uh, and this is what you see within Modeler. Um, and the thing about Modeler that makes it relevant to this discussion is that it works with very, very uh, dense meshes. Um, what Henry Morton earlier referred to as triangle dust, I think referred, is applicable to, to what we're doing. Uh, so in a scene like this, um, uh, it's, it's sourced from about uh, 2.3 billion triangles. Um, there's around 3,600 instances of 132 unique objects. Uh, but because of the combination of instancing, LOD, and occlusion culling, we reduce that uh, that number down to roughly around 15 million. That actually, it's, it's more in the range of 10 to, to 20 million rasterized triangles each 
frame. And so as a result, we're able to render at, at uh, 90 hertz in VR on a, on a uh, RTX 3070 uh, desktop class GPU. Um, and so this visualization shows a color coded view of each of the instances in Modeler. Uh, the, um, the surface representation for Modeler uh, is that each the shared data of each instance stores both a signed distance field voxel grid as well as a triangle mesh. Uh, the voxel grid can be very dense. Uh, each of the individual voxel grids can be up to 1 million uh, voxels in, in each dimension. Uh, and those are stored sparsely using a two-level hash table. So we divide the space up into 256 uh, size cubes, uh, which are further divided into eight uh, cube size voxel blocks, uh, which then store per voxel assigned distance value and a albedo color. Uh, the key to this is truncating the signed distances to just the narrow band of negative two to positive two and not storing anything outside that range. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Modeler actually uses both SDFs and triangle meshes. So as you edit and sculpt, um, we maintain both of those data structures and keep them in sync. Uh, and so for the triangle meshes, uh, that is what we actually rasterize and render from frame to frame. And the way those are organized is that each 64 cubed block of the voxel grid has a small triangle mesh octree associated with it, uh, holding four LODs. Uh, and each vertex in this data stores just 10 bytes. Uh, we get away with that by storing the XYZ positions uh, in eight bits each uh, relative to its, its block's origin. Uh, and then we use four bytes for the vertex normal and three bytes for the um, RGB albedo color. Um, uh, I'll skip past that. Um, and so just to kind of give you an idea of, of, of what's happening very quickly, um, on, on the left, you can see the, the mesh clusters as they've been uh, LED'd. And on the right, you can see the occlusion culling, which is key to be able to render this kind of artist-generated content at, um, at uh, reasonable frame rates. And so uh, in Modeler, the triangle meshes are not just used for rendering, though. Um, uh, although it's an SDF-based Modeler, we also use the triangle meshes for several tools. Um, and so here you're seeing the warp tool, uh, which actually operates on the triangle mesh data and takes the section that you have deformed and then quickly converts that back to an SDF from which we generate a new triangle mesh. And we're doing all that very quickly. Um, and so this is an important aspect of Modeler that we use both the SDFs and the triangle meshes for sculpting operations and keeping both of the surface, surface representations up to date as you are editing. Uh, and so this is where I think triangle meshes are really useful, um, at least for, for our purposes, uh, because they're really excellent at deformation and, and um, you know, in a game engine, you have animation and skinning and so forth. And so let's get back to the original questions. Are 2D textures dead? Well, in Modeler, we actually don't use UVs or texture maps at runtime for the, for the sculpt. Uh, but when you export data out of Modeler, you export a triangle mesh into um, some triangle mesh file format like USD or FBX. And so at that point, we will optionally uh, UV unwrap the mesh for you. Um, however, to be able to do that efficiently, um, uh, we, we, we do have to uh, decimate the, the mesh fairly significantly. Um, and so in the future, uh, will we skip UVs entirely and have downstream applications uh, be able to use highly dense meshes with vertex color channels containing uh, different attributes. Um, you, can, you can do that in Nanite right now, uh, at, least, at least I think with albedo vertex color, and it actually works well. But uh, do we really want to do that in all cases? Um, I think there's, there's a lot of nice reasons to take an exported triangle mesh into another program, whether it's, it's into a Substance Painter or another uh, uh, painting application. Um, and as a, as a content creation, application, frankly, at this point, we can't be too opinionated about what artists want to do with their data after it's exported out of Modeler. And so our triangle mesh is dead. Um, I, think that the, I think that for the purposes of, of, of deformation and animation, um, they really are the best choice for being able to um, arbitrarily deform a mesh. Uh, and because of that, I think triangle meshes will, will be with us for, uh, for some time. Uh, okay. And that's uh, that's what I have to uh, to say. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David. So before starting the discussion, we'll conclude with the the last presentation by Alex Evans from uh, from Nvidia.
Hello. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, okay, I'm on screen. Um, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me here. I'm the SDF guy uh, for a long time uh, at, at NVIDIA. Anytime somebody said SDF, I would kind of appear on Slack like a golem. So um, if I say something that shocks you, all my SDF friends, I'm actually going to say some triangle positive things in a moment. So um, yeah, apologies to my SDF buddies. Um, so uh, I was thinking about high performance graphics before we get to the same questions. I'm going last, I was worried I'd, there'd be nothing more to say. And I was thinking, well, kind of geometry is already pretty high performance, right? Like um, uh, triangle counts are going up. And um, uh, as uh, Petri Klarberg at the HPG um, uh, keynote this year showed, like, you know, we can take um, 3 billion triangles and we can uh, do 30 bounds path tracing at, at 33 frames a second on a single GPU today. So we're already doing high, high performance geometry already. So like, I, you know, I was pondering, what should I talk about? Um, it's already solved, right? <clears throat> and uh, and the point is, I, I really like finely tested geometry. Um, uh, you know, they make a lot of a lot of things easier. That um, Henry mentioned uh, triangle dust, and like once everything is triangle dust, everything gets easier, right? Because you you can just use vertex or face colors. You don't need any UVs. You don't need textures. You can just tessellate over the hell. Um, and actually, culling and LOD become much easier because everything is so uniformly tessellated. Everything is so tiny that you can take extra trees and those sort of things. Um, and anyway, these days you want to get most of your surface, you know, variation from the geometry. So the textures are often very simple, um, or they're just detailed maps. Um, but the problem is that as soon as you go to like finely tessellated um, world, uh, it puts a lot of pressure on all the boring bits of your code, right? So you start to hit memory limits, like loading a billion triangles. And I'm so thankful that we haven't really covered this so far in the talks. But for me, this is actually the biggest single hole for getting to like this world of polygon dust the world of getting billions and billions of triangles and you need you need things like streaming you need you need um um a lot more complexity and worst of all is the content creation as jonathan mentioned there's kind of two views you can have the view of the content creator and you can have the view of the engine programmer the graphics researcher writing a paper um who tends to focus on the runtime performance but actually the the, the performance of these things uh when you're editing is a huge deal, and like editing UV maps with millions of triangles is is, is horrible. Um, and so, who cares about lo uh, loading and saving time? Well, the problem is nobody does. And so, like, I'm half trolling here, but who's doing the most important work in high performance geometry at the moment? Is it Aris uh, XUNT? Maybe because he just uh, landed a change to Blender, I believe, uh, which uh, reduced their OBJ load time for seven million triangles, which isn't even that heavy these days, from 239 seconds to 18 seconds. And if you ask the artist what the experience is of working with these kind of um, heavy meshes. You know, we all talk about like, yay, we can do like a million triangle meshes now, and we can do photogrammetry, and we can do nanite, and we can do these things. But actually, the, the artist workflow is absolutely miserable, right? They're all dying in the corner trying to pull the UVs around for these million triangle things. Uh, thank you for setting me up, Jonathan. And uh, yeah, so this is this is actually super important. Um, and actually, I think this is the greatest contribution of nanite as well. So like, hats off to um, the Epic team. Uh, and, and people talk about the micro triangle rasterizer and the and the, the sort of the, the pixel end of nanite. But actually, the most interesting thing about nanite is that they did all of the boring bits. They did this end-to-end -end system that um, gets gigabytes worth of triangle meshes into the right place at the right time at the LOD you want. You know, they exploit the multi gigabyte per second SSDs we have. Right? They are blowing even Aris's new OBJ loader absolutely out of the water. And what we need to do, and that my you know. I'm for everyone, and I embarrassingly am not working on this right now myself. So this is to myself as well. In the mirror, Alex, we all need to be working on making the experience of working with very finely tested meshes way better because it, it, it's not good right now. Um, and so you might expect the answer to the questions to get to the kind of, you know, what's dead, what's not dead. You might think like, yeah, we don't need to do UVs anymore. We can just test laid everything to, to dust. But actually, in reality, um, as other people have already said, so I won't labor these points, parameterizations are super useful you just know you know there's no need to bend them that they're, they're a great tool and um uh we need them uh, especially in content creation um and we can distinguish between the creation workflow which probably will have uvs for a long time to come and the delivery the pick the, the triangle dust which potentially could just have vertex colors um and uh and, and you know what does that mean textures are dead as well definitely not i mean they're just images as other people have said i mean maybe these kind of charts are going to go away and um, i hadn't actually seen the h text uh, paper before uh, writing these slides, but you know, H text and P text before it are great examples of how maybe old school charts are going to go away. But you know, two D textures as images and gradients in a procedural pipeline, absolutely, they're not going to go away um, because you know we're going to be building brushes, detail maps, decals, 
all these sorts of things, and everything is going to be procedural soup. Um, I think, as Henry mentioned, like you know, at some point you need to create this procedural dust rapidly, and that doesn't just mean from the disk and the network. That can mean procedurally. You know, like in the film industry now, it's a standard pipeline to build cloth out of individual hairs, which are like you know modeled in Houdini or whatever tool it is. And and so we're basically dealing with procedural soups and we need to find quick ways to texture them and 2D images are not gonna go away as part of that pipeline, even if it all gets baked down to vertex colors in terms of the final delivery. And, you know, I had to include a slide about other representations, but I am the um, SDF person. So my previous work, uh, I worked in a game called Dreams at PlayStation. This image on the left is, um, it shares a lot of DNA actually with um, uh, Adobe's, uh, substance uh, modeler that you just saw. So, so imagine that, but on a PlayStation. Um, and these this lovely filling with breakfast, there are no triangles here. We, uh, unlike our substance, this is pure SDF, uh, ray marched directly on the um, compute shaders and pixel shaders. Um, and so that, you know, so there are no triangles, UVs, there's no unwrapping. It's literally uh, a color per voxel. Um, and, you know, you can get some great results. And, you know, I've recently been working on instant NGP and Nerf, and do I think these are useful? Yes, but they're not going to replace triangles. I just think that um, because we have this zoo of alternative representations, they will all find their niches. But, um, you know, measures, as other people have said, but they're just not going away. Um, so uh, just to summarize, this is my last slide. Um, I think the future is going to be basically highly tessellated. I think that's the key. And what I want to implore everyone to think about a bit more is once we're in a highly tessellated world, you know, as, as researchers, we can notice a 5 million poly mesh and wait five seconds and it doesn't matter. But when you're loading like that every day or you're loading tens or hundreds of these meshes, the load times and the, and the iteration times become uh, pivotal and, and deathly. And so I think we need to, we need to improve that. Okay. Um, that's what I have to say. Thanks a lot, Alex. And thanks to all the speakers. We have to offer thanks for playing this little game with us. Uh, you, you did well. We are obviously all working for the Triangle Lobby. And uh, I, I can see that uh, all of you uh, kind of agree on, uh, on the fact that triangles are around for a good reason. The interesting thing is that you didn't pick up the same reason. Like each of you had a different, uh, found useful in a different way, triangles today, and same for textures, 2D textures. So I'm going to open up the discussion, but before I try to quote maybe one, one thing for each of you that, that you have been stating. Henry mentioned that we cannot expect the, the hardware to, to double in perf, in performance in the next few years, just such as we experienced maybe in the past, which might be actually what may drive us in believing that the future would be going on and on on the resolution side. Jonathan mentioned that uh, Actually, UVDES is already here and used in a specific industry, VFX and animation, not yet in game, but we are currently working on that. And if textures might disappear, texture tiles, for instance, might stay around for a long time. Uh, Ryan sees any other representation as a form of interface to triangle meshes. <laughs> I love this, because that, that's actually not completely wrong. And that's, uh, I tend to agree with that. But I don't try to uh, voice my opinions here. We have the speakers and they are here too answer your questions, guys. So please ask your questions on the side while I'm summarizing this, uh, this exchange. Uh, David has been pointing the interop between different representations and has shown a great example of how SDF and triangles can be uh, together and underlining another use of triangles, which is true, that is for, for the formations to be, uh, it's very handy to define the formations with triangles and other representations are actually hard to, um, to come up with when it comes to precise deformation. And finally, Alex, first of all, thank you for your keynote at EGSR last year, because I think it kind of sparked the question between Angel and myself about the, the topic of today's uh, keynote. And we wanted to have like the opinion of various leaders uh, in the industry. And uh, you, you pointed out at several moments that in the workflow, the main problem might not be the one we think about, but actually loading a mesh might actually still be the number one problem we, we need to solve. So that was a very quick summary. All of you guys have been sharing with us a lot of other thoughts. Fortunately, this is recorded, and I'm sure many students will have a chance to actually listen to that, even those who are not attending today. And uh, I'm going to go with the questions in order and uh, ask my own questions in case we, uh, we empty the list. And so I will start with a question asked by Andrew, actually my co-chair, who's actually extending the question to all of you to testation. So is real-time testation dead? 
in, in the context of everything you have been showing and discussing today. So short answers. And uh, the first one of you who want to say a word about it is welcome to start. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it comes down to definitions also, right? It's yes. like, okay, what do, you, what do you mean by tessellation? Do you mean hull shaders and tessellation shaders? Those are probably on their way out. Yes. Mesh shaders, people like those. What about in the context of ray tracing? Nothing exists. Um, you know, and how does tessellation exist in the context of a BDH? That's a, you know, BDH is like triangles um, and maybe some other things someday, but right now. All right, okay. I think that uh, answers a part of the question. Other comments about this? I'm a tessellation guy, so I, I, I could comment on that, but I won't. I think, Tammy, you have a great paper on real-time tessellation recently, no? I believe the name of the paper is called Tessellation Free <laughs> Displacement Mapping. Which right, okay, okay, all right. From that. But yes. Well, that's, that's all right. So if tessellation doesn't result in triangles that you store or rasterize, does that mean they don't exist? It's like not tessellated? Ah, that seems to me you're tessellating. That's a philosophical question somehow. Yeah, you're right. I don't have an intersection. <laughs> All right, let's uh, maybe move on to the to the next question. So uh, NERF and uh, neural models have been mentioned by several of you. Uh, and someone is asking whether, uh, because NERF is like a vast zoo of like many, many different kinds of techniques from all scene to actually textures, uh, or at least like shell space uh, reflectance models. So what? When you refer to nerves, like for those, those of you who have been referring to that, do you see them as a substitute to UV textures? And uh, we know over the last two years, there has been a bunch of papers that, that actually try to do that to replace the SVBRDF with uh, actually a, a neural representation. And are they good only in cases of microfibers, which, turn, which in turn have to be tiled? Yeah, so that's about like how new representation can coexist with the existing ones. I'll, I'll bite something, which is that uh, um, looking at back to the tessellation and actually Tammy, your paper, like I think that there's a path forward to these kind of crust like um, where you have an underlying 2D shape and then you basically extrude it and you do something within that. And there's a few papers that are doing kind of height fields and rediscovering, you know, like parallax occlusion mapping and these old techniques, which are like not quite triangles, as Henry's saying, like the triangles don't quite exist, but you, you ray march them or you do something. And for me, Nerf. Uh, yes, there's a volume rendering part of it where you ray march and you, you have some neural representation, but it's really about um, the neural side is more about the content creation or the or the compression of the resulting volume. And I don't know exactly which compression scheme or representation scheme will pan out as the right one, but I do think that there is going to be scope for these kind of dis displacement plus plus or on the fly displacement. These kind of techniques that, that, that exist in shells, I think will have some, I hope they have traction because I love, I love the look of them and I hope that they will they will lack. I don't know if they will, but I hope so. Actually, I know Serban was attending HPG. Serban was the original author of Shell Maps, uh, Seagraph 2005. I don't know if he's here, but uh, he's here. <laughs> oh, so that's great. Great work. Great work. Any other comment on this? Nerf are all, all around the place these days, so I'm sure everyone has an opinion about it. I, I, I actually have a question on that topic. and given that there are other people here who probably uh, know the answers. What's, I guess, what's the trade-off between calculating these uh, things from first principles versus um, caching them, you know, running from frame to frame and have a running cache versus, like, I don't know what the efficiency trade-off is between triangles with textures and nerf models, for example. Does that question even make sense? It does. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a hard question though. I think it depends on what, at what, at what scale you switch to Nerf. Or like, like I think that as a from a graphics researcher perspective, I see Nerf as a kind of a, a continuation of volume rendering, and it, it's almost like it's removed the stigma from volume rendering because it's trendy. We can now do volume rendering again, and um, so I, I see it entirely in terms of like, well, we could have covered these things in gigavoxels, you know, Cyril Krasnow's work. But it wasn't, it was sort of verboten because it, it wasn't fast enough and it wasn't like su supported by hardware. But now nerfs have come along and basically given us a new fresh view on how to compress these things a bit more heavily and how to capture them from the real world. 
But fundamentally, your question, I think, is best answered in terms of like, how should we cache volumes? And it's like, well, there's Pixar's Brit Maps and there's Gigavoxels and there's, you know, potentially tra online trained nurse. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think different people will choose different points in that in that spectrum of trade-offs. Because and your your question is as vague as should we do volume rendering? And my answer to that is always emphatically yes. But it's yes. difficult to yeah yeah yeah. Great. Um, before taking the next question, I'm going to extend this question because uh, I noticed in uh, all your talks that uh, several of you, pretty much all of you, have referred in a way or another to this notion of cache or intermediate representation for which hardware consideration and, and actually performance imposes representation as low level as texels and triangles. So from the fact that Ryan was considering that the interface to triangles are nerves or like any other representation is actually an interface, to the fact that actually polygons to rasterize remain the fastest thing we can do today, it looks like this could be also a, a new status for triangle meshes and texture maps to not be actually the, the the DCC output, but an automatically defined and generated layer in the stack, which brings the question of hardware support of the higher level representations. Now, a bunch of you have been working on, for instance, subdivision support on the, on the GPU. Uh, SDF are now a big thing in, uh, in DCC. Same goes with NERFs. I'd like to, to extend the question and ask you whether you think that another, a second level of repre geometric representation would make sense on the GPU, on graphics hardware in the near future? So one of the problems that we run into with Triangle Dust as the lingua franca is building BBHs. So if there were a higher level representation that had similar efficiency to triangles that didn't have the BBH cost, I mean, I think I'm under the impression that Nanite runs into the same problem. They do a spectacular job of delivering right size triangles for rasterization, but building BVH with Nanite is a little bit more painful, especially if it's happening frame after frame. So there might be room for something that helps with the ray tracing problem in a sense. I don't know. I'd love to do the perspective from uh, Jonathan, Ryan, David as well, because you guys are in uh, DCC content creation. Uh, maybe you are working at a higher level than, uh, for instance, in NVIDIA uh, in the stack. Uh, what's your opinion about the level of hardware support that should be provided to high level, higher level uh, representations? Uh, so I, I can start then. Uh, well, I think you would have you would you would need to have a primitive that can compete with triangles in the first place. Like uh, right now, surface meshes are really the the most intuitive thing for artists to use. Uh, so for I, I would say manual content creation. Now, if you if you look at more automatic procedures, you would have perhaps point clouds and other data structures. But for whatever is created by artists, and that's in the case of Unity, that's the, the most uh, important, uh, um, the most pre prevalent kind of asset. Uh, the, we don't have a replacement for, for surface mesh. We don't have a, a, a competing primitive uh, for, for meshes. And what's also, I mean, there's authoring, but there's also rendering, and there's also level of detail. I mean, uh, uh, we, can, we can do a very good level of detail with uh, meshes up to a certain degree, after which uh, volumetrics uh, representation could kick in. And actually, just to kick back to the previous question, that we still have this uh, big challenge to, to solve where we don't have a unified representation between volumetric and surfacing. Uh, when, we, when we're rendering surfaces, we have a dedicated uh, rendering uh, algorithm. And when we're doing volumes, we have a, another uh, uh, renderer that basically kicks in. And you have these two backends to support, and are, are, they're not compatible with each other. We still don't have voxels that can act as um, surfaces and that can mipmap so, so as to create three levels of detail. And we don't have, obviously, triangles that can behave like volumes uh, by definition because they're surface elements. Um, so yeah, I mean, as long as we triangles, are, well, not really triangles, but surface meshes are really uh, 
a super super versatile primitive and it's i think it's going to be hard to to compete with that so we'll have a, a zoo like i liked alex uh, alex's um uh, formulation we'll have a zoo and alternatives but at the end of the day you'll probably have some meshes in there especially if you have artists modeling you know manufactured stuff like cars and you know industrial things that you always find in games and uh, in movies as well um i don't know i don't i'm not sure i have a great answer to this question i i, I personally was very sad that tessellation shaders never really took off and the idea of having a sort of multi like a multi-scale representation for meshes um which is maybe maybe uh you know if, if it's if it's triangle dust at the finest level what i would like to be able to send to the gpu is something a little bit coarser than the triangle dust plus the instructions for turning that into the triangle dust um most services like something we've seen with people using nanite is that the there's the in sort of intrinsic shape doesn't require millions of triangles um you know and that's you can see like how you know almost all sculpting tools where people create those super detailed models, you have a hierarchy of base meshes. And at some level, you're adding like fine grained detail to a base shape. And we don't really have a way to give that to the GPU, even for a surface mesh, right? That, and tessellation was the sort of closest thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it sort of it never took off, um, which is just sad. I had big plans for tessellation, but I'm still waiting. But, but Ryan, the, I mean, like the, the fundamental problem with desolation shaders was that they were creating these triangles procedurally that were going to be rasterized in a few pixels. So they were fundamentally inefficient for a GPU rasterizer. And with Nanite, you, you kind of came up with a, a different tessellation scheme that's actually super efficient for micro polygons. So haven't um, you the base The base data for Nanite though is the high res mesh, right? It, you, you, okay. you know, as Alex was saying, and it's a real problem, the millions of triangles import. Um, yeah. I mean, our artists who are using Nanite have to import those millions of triangles into Unreal Engine. And they come to me and complain about the import slow and they can be rendered yes. really fast, but they are imported very slow. And I always have to say like, well, we don't have a special processor designed specifically for importing files. Um, but uh, yeah, Nanite right now, builds off of those high, re like you have to have the high resolution triangle mesh and it builds from that. Hmm. I think in, in modeler, um, well, in terms of hardware support for high level surface representations, one of the, um, one of the, the nice things about the way that modeler is set up is that, that, that all those voxel grids are, um, are voxel grids and so to generate BVHs from them, uh, it's, it's it's very natural to kind of operate on voxel grid boundaries. Um, and in that sense, it's operating with with volumetric data, but it's it's more volumetric data that captures the the geometric surface uh, detail. Um, and uh, it's 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 very natural to to, to subdivide <clears throat> along those those boundaries and generate triangle meshes, generate your triangle dust from from that. Um, but, uh, but, but, but generally, I think that that's, um, I don't think that that's something that, that should be done by the hardware so much as, 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 as just performed with, uh, with, with a lot of, of compute power. Um, the only thing that would come to mind is if, um, if there was a, a way to accelerate um, hash table operations <laughs> so that 3D, 3D, um, 3D lookups and so forth could be as, as fast as a 2D texture lookup. But uh, obviously, there are very good reasons for uh, for for uh, for that being uh, more more complicated. And since Alex is working at Nvidia and a big SDF fan, maybe he's working on that. Yeah, well, I, 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 I've been on SDF holiday for a while, but you never know. Um, I, I, one thing I was thinking about was uh, Henry's uh, legacy thing. And I, uh, there's this adage that, like, if in the absence of any extra information, you should assume that everything is halfway through its life. So, like, this, this panel is about what's going to live and what's going to die. And it's like we've had triangles for 30-plus years, so we're probably going to have them for 30-plus more years. We've had Nerf for one year, so, you know, I want Nerf to live a lot longer than one year, but the point is that it, it, we shouldn't we shouldn't fall for recency bias or whatever it's called. But we should we should assume that the tried and tested things are going to live uh, for a long time. And um, I'm actually pretty comfortable with this idea that we that we have like great triangle pipelines and great texture pipelines um, 
And then all the other things to serve as like amplifiers or ways to augment um, graphics in general. So like, you know, the tools that we're all creating and other papers that we're all writing serve to kind of boost the, the quality. But yeah, in the end, we're never going to lose the things we've had for 30 years. I, yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, I think we still have time for uh, a round of answer regarding the last question that is on the board. Guys, in the attendance, please do not hesitate to ask more questions. We, we can probably sneak one, one more. And the last question is, uh, which do you think would be the next big ways to break the, the memory barrier wall other than H HBM? So a rather low level question in terms of hardware, but at some point uh, loading, I mean, <laughs> loading assets is also a, a memory problem, a memory speed problem. So I don't know what's your opinion about that, guys. I, I, I thought about the question after listening to Henry talking about uh, using like smaller elements instead of triangles, right? So if you go with that kind of architecture, you're going to need massive amounts of bandwidth, massive amounts of memory. I can't see any other way of doing it. And well, I think memory technology isn't there yet. Sure. Um, I guess a couple of comments directly about the question. Um, I mean, basically, innovation in memory is driven driven by economics. It's also get to some degree de 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 driven by physics but um in the in the sense that can we deploy so much floating point horsepower that we can't actually feed it with the bandwidth that's available as long as things stay reasonably balanced it doesn't matter i'm not an expert on uh, memory technology so i can't or you know or low level signaling interfaces so i can't speak to that but to your comment about um you know, uh, triangle dust and the implications of that, that speaks to me as a compression problem. Because um, one of the things that I observed and that, that nanite explodes, ex explodes, ex exploits um, tremendously is that in these very, very richly detailed models, there's also a, an absurd amount of redundancy. And, you know, it's a hugely, it's a great target for compression. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think eventually, especially for transmission of assets, storage of assets, that compression technologies like Nanite um, and, and others that may emerge make lots of sense. Because um, certainly a, a, a raw triangle mesh is an absurdly, um, you know, it's like universal, but it's also absurdly inefficient. And, and I think that speaks to Ryan's point of like, he was longing for a triangle a bit coarser than the dust and then have the instructions to degenerate the dust. And that's exactly the same thing that Henry's talking about, the compression. And I see compression as like one simplistic data point in a sort of spectrum of, of anything that's procedurally generated, right? Compression is just one form of procedural generation. And you could actually see all sorts of ways of, you know, like the old school fractal landscapes, you just add noise. And that's, that's like, you know, 10, parameters and you get you get a whole landscape and I think that that this on the fly generation from some parametric model and compression and all the space within that and there's lastly I wanted to point out that there was a paper at HPG yesterday I think that the uh, billion point uh, cloud rendering paper and I think it's telling that in terms of what they contributed on top of previous work it was mostly that it was a compression thing right they were like oh we've realized that we only need to store 10 bits per Per coordinate and so we can we can cut the bandwidth in, in a third and so this is already happening like we're already seeing the research which is essentially hey look we can do compression to, to, to improve the performance of these very high you know, triangle dust or point dust in that case so yeah generation and compression plus one yeah part of the um reason i mentioned the sort of like some kind of way to generate the triangle dust is that uh one of the things that i think is is getting you know, incrementally worse over time in, in graphics is our ability to do uh, like what we need for something like a 3D sculpting tool where uh, we don't know ahead of time what the shape is and it's changing every frame and not in a structured way, like with a skinned mesh or something where we can do it on the GPU. Uh, I mean, sometimes you can do it on the GPU, but basically there, you know, compression would make it slower essentially, right? You can't afford to compress it, to send it to the GPU and have the GPU be smart about all the things it's smart about, like in in the nanite rendering, 
um, we, you know, it, it's getting harder and harder to build interactive tools that can handle these huge amounts of data because we can't get them to the GPU, but we need access to them on the CPU. We're just not trying hard enough. You're right. You're right today, but I hope you're not right. To, you know, in the yeah, future. me too. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, it's funny. You, you there are a couple of things that I kind of react to there. It's not an accident that Nanite stores topology at like four bits per triangle on disk and stores it more like 17 bits when you're actually trying to interact with it in rendering. I mean, this is documented in the slides. It's not like I'm saying anything that's news. The other thing to Alex's point about you're not trying hard enough, most of the dedicated hardware that you would build for subdivision surfaces or any number of high level primitives, it's really better cast as a dedicated software problem I mean, Nanite's rasterizer, it's compute rasterizer is a great example of this where hardware doesn't actually make it any better. Um, you know, and when you start looking at things like subdivision surface evaluation, the amount of floating point involved in that to do it quickly is just crazy. And you would never delay down that floating point other than make it available in a processor that you then program. So like dedicated code that does sub D evaluation is the thing that you ultimately want. And it's also a lot more flexible, but someone has to sit down and work hard to make it work well. Um, so they, the idea of dedicated hardware for new primitives, it's got a really narrow sweet spot where it's not so expensive that you wouldn't want just more horsepower in the processor. And it's not so stupid that it can't actually do anything useful. Anyway. I would dare to make a comment here. Uh, I have a feeling that we are moving more and more toward a program-based representation of assets. And it speaks well to the compression problem because then the, the complexity of the assets and what can be managed in memory in a reasonable amount of time is proportional to the uh, Kolmogorov complexity, actually, of the, the underlying graph that defines the process that produces the texture or the, or the shape. So actually, on the fly decompression on the GPU, is, I think, a, a, a really interesting topic uh, for future research, which means that for DCC, for people who are creating tools, <laughs> like depression, is also I'm hearing a dog here. <laughs> I think the dog was was agreeing with me, and that's perfect to actually conclude this, uh, this question uh, moment. Uh, we don't have any more questions. So I'd like to thank all of you guys for taking the time to share your your opinion on that. A big round of applause, please, everyone. And uh, I, I encourage everyone to join the social room to continue the discussion in, uh, in 101s or in small groups. HPG will continue tomorrow with an amazing program. Please check it online. And uh, see you very soon. Thanks, guys. It's fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to you.